Well, greetings and salutations, Series 7 test takers. This is Dean Tenney, also known as the Series 7 Guru, coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. And as you can see, we already have a performance opportunity queued up on the screen. Uh, Sydney and other viewers have found shared screened uh, finals uh, to be very uh, helpful. And Sydney was using uh, STC and had uh, mentioned that we could do a shared screen practice final with SDC. And I told her, well, that's great that she's giving us permission to do that or me permission to do that and share it with the rest of you. But, uh, you know, I still have to clear that with SDC. So I did reach out to uh, Todd and his team at SDC, and they did indeed uh, give us permission to use their content for this uh, practice test to do a little intellectual inventory, get a mark for Sydney on where she's at. Uh, once I received that permission, I went ahead and purchased they're a supplement. I'm a big believer in supplements, free supplements, paid supplements. You can never have too many practice questions. And STC does uh, offer three or four practice exams, supplemental practice exams for $87. I went ahead and purchased those. And we're going to be working our way through the uh, first of those. And uh, what you should do is hit pause. Uh, hear Sydney work her way through it. Hear me, you know, explicate. These are called explications, kind of riff a little bit on the questions and uh, see how you do in terms of this practice exam. Uh, Sydney, you ready to go? You got anything you want to comment? Are you ready to rock and roll? Ready to go. <laughs> All right, question number one. If a withdrawal from a variable annuity is taken during the accumulation period, how is it taxed? Um, earnings from variable during the accumulation period, they're not taxed. That's right? correct. So. I think it would be earnings are withdrawn and not taxed. Incorrect. When you withdraw it, it's going to be LIFO. Okay. Last monies in are first monies out. So very testable, right? You were right about the part about it's gross tax deferred. Mm -hmm. And that's why we refer to it as a non-qualified retirement plan. Okay. Uh, but if the answer here, I, I think it's A, but you know, we uh, are following SDC's advice on their first practice exam in their supplement to put on the, the explanation. So let's see, boom. Incorrect answer chosen. Yeah, there we go. The life was the key point. Last money's in, first money's out. That is the key, key point. Okay. All right. Uh, clients who want to reduce their tax liability may invest in which of the following? Which of the following? Okay, so when you want to reduce your tax liability, I automatically start thinking about municipals. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But you can also reduce your tax liability from your Roth IRA. I like it. That's exactly so. This is where RTFQ comes in, right? It's not asking us about tax-free income. Mm -hmm. It's asking us about how do we reduce our tax liability, right? So if yeah. we have adjusted gross income of $60,000, what mm -hmm. would bring that $60,000 perhaps down, right? And you're on the right track, you know, They're if you fund it. are tax deferred, so they offer that. Right on, right? So. Oh, no, um, go see before you click it. You clicked traditional IRAs and limited partnerships. Yeah, because that, again, the traditional IRA, by funding it, will lower your adjusted gross income. And the partnerships are flowing. Is that not your answer? Do you want something else? I was going to do annuities and Roth IRAs. I don't well, know. Well, that Roth IRA member is for being both variable annuities and Roth IRAs are being funded with after-tax money, money you've already paid taxes on. And so that would not reduce your tax liability. Okay. Right. To reduce your tax liability, you got to bring your adjusted gross income down, right? So traditional okay. IRAs permit sure. deductible, there's the key word, contributions. And limited partners of ships provide tax credits. Do you know, uh, I'll just poke around your brain, housing group, what partnerships would provide you with a tax credit, a dollar for dollar whack out of your tax bill? Wouldn't that be the... It wouldn't be the C Corp because C Corp corps are double. It would tax. be his, historic real estate. Yeah. Historic real estate and low income housing. Okay. Yeah. All and of those. If we were talking about like um, 
Like the oil and gas ones, wouldn't the income program offer you like? Well, the income would be sheltered by depreciation, perhaps. But yeah, partnerships have that flow through. But remember, the key word in this question is reduce your tax liability. Okay, yeah. I so I'm your accountant. I say, Sydney, you owe $20,000 to <clears> the IRS. And you say, Dean, is there a way I can reduce that $20,000? I say, Sydney, if we had some tax credits, yes. Or okay. if we funded IRA, have you funded a traditional IRA? And do you, uh, you know, do you make over a hundred grand, you know, because we might be able to fund an IRA and take down that adjusted gross income. All right, let's get it together. We're off to an O and two start. Let's get it together here. Oh. And a new municipal issue, new municipal issuer, a group, ugh, new municipal issue. What is a group order? What is a group order? Institution purchasing bonds. From a syndicate dealer buying for a group of investors. I don't think that it's an order placed by three or more members. It is not. You are correct. Process of elimination. A is out. An order allowing all members to benefit. Group order. Do all members benefit? Um, an institution purchasing bonds from a syndicate. I don't think I'm between B or D potentially. I like it. So what is your uh, gut choice? You were correct. 50, 50. It's either B or D. You're correct. Okay. <clears throat> My gut is leaning towards like uh, B. Excellent. Go with your gut. Remember, we've talked about that. You want to have confidence mm -hmm. in yourself. Now, I would defer, de de defer to my friends at STC here. Uh, I haven't seen anybody on Debrief tell me they've seen this in quite a while, you know, years, about pre-sale orders, group orders, designated orders, and member orders. And for years, those of us who present this would present you with a memory aid called Pro Golfers Don't Miss or Pretty Girls Date More or Pretty Guys Date More whatever, you know, your, your preference is. Uh, I don't think this is something to worry about, but pre-sale okay. orders would be orders received before the syndic was, was awarded the underwriting. Group orders are where the investor says, Dean, I don't want to offend anybody in the syndicate, leave my order group or undesignated, share my largesse, my, you know, credit with everybody. Designated orders where I say designate Sydney at Raymond James. And boo, you know, that would be nice. And then member orders are what we want for our own inventory, our own inventory. It was a pretty good question though, because I've never seen a question like this. Yeah. And well, I only know the like order, like pro golfers don't miss. Yeah. Well, like I say, that's one of the reasons to get supplemental exams like these. So I know that uh, you, Sydney, are fortunate enough to have the resources to get a tutor like like me for, you know, work for you and, you know, buy other supplements and, uh, if you have those resources, I'm a big believer in uh, using that, whether it's a tutor or a paid supplement to getting some more practice questions, whatever the case may be. Uh, as a result of falling interest rates, a significant number of bonds are held by a bond fund. And they've been called. Rather than reinvesting the money, the fund has distributed the proceeds to its shareholder as a return of capital. Well, I kind of like this question. How will this distribution be taxed? Uh, let me just reread the question. Yeah, that's pretty tricky. As a result of falling interest rates, a significant number of bonds that are held by a bond fund have been called. And right. So that, and that's that's key because that means they didn't sell the bonds, right? They didn't sell the bonds. Rather than reinvesting the money, from the proceeds, right? So the call. The mm -hmm. fund has distributed the proceeds to its shareholder as a return of capital. So two pivot words here. The bonds have been called, not sold, and they've been returned to you as a, a part of your capital. So how will this distribution be taxed to the shareholder? I don't think it's going to be a long or a short-term gain because- You're correct. You're correct. You haven't sold it. And unless you sell, like you can't have a capital gain. Beautiful. Um, 
I think it's not tax since it's a return of the cost basis. Excellent. That was a tough one. Good job. That was, that was a, a really job. weird question. Yeah, it, well, you know, but that's part of it. I like Thank it. You I, you know, chosen. This would have been very easy to miss. You know, I always say RTFQ, read the full question. Uh, but this would have been very easy to miss because if you're going pretty quickly, you could say, Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a long term capital gain. And so, you know, you got to be real careful on that one. Wait, I'm so confused. Why does it say incorrect answer chosen? But it looks green. Do you think the computer's just Oh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's not taxed as since it's a return of capital. That's I don't know why it's doing it. Uh, it is not taxed. It's a return of the as a return of cost basis, not tax. I think it's right because it would have had a red X on one of the. Yeah, I think so. I think so. We'll see when we score it up. <laughs> uh, the interest received from which of the following uh, bonds exempt is exempt from federal, state, and local taxes for an investor who lives in state A. So I think for this question, they want you to remember that if you have a municipal bond and it's in the same state, you're free of state and federal. You are correct. That's exactly what this <laughs> question's about. So they want to know which bond will provide you with that triple free tax exemption. That's correct. Okay. So um, it says a bond issued by a municipality located in state A um, and they live in state A. So state B would not provide them. That's like, exactly right. Corporate bonds definitely are taxable. You not do it in um, federal, state, and local. Treasury bonds are federally tax exempt, but they're subject to state. Exactly correct. So I don't think it would be A either. You're correct. And I don't think a corporation would be a municipal bond. It'd be the municipality, right? right? Say it again. Like the corporation. Like yeah, a corporations bond. is taxable. So yeah, you right. Make it. So it would be the municipality, right? That's correct. And yeah, that's right. So your state A, boom. Uh, I don't know. We have some kind of funky thing going on. That is correct. So it's been no. subject <laughs> to state. However, investors who buy municipal bonds from state. Yeah, no, this is correct. We got it correct. The bond yeah. issue, the interest received. So we got it correct. I don't know why it's telling us it's an incorrect answer. Yeah, it says corporate bond is always taxed. Yeah, all right. Well, there's some glitch in the universe. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Okay. Uh, an investor believes that the U.S. dollar is going to weaken against the British pound. And when the spot price of the pound is a dollar seventy-one, she purchases a British pound April one seventy-four call for two and a half. Uh, what must the British spot price be for the investor to break even? Okay, so you're going weak against the British pound when the spot price for the pound is one point seven one. She purchases it. so for this one. Like I would be dealing with the one seventy call for two fifty. Yep. Um. Obviously, the spot price is different, so it's gonna be like the decimal. So I'm gonna have to just do this really quickly. I believe it's gonna be. I'm leaning towards C. Well, what is your break even yes. for call contracts? What is your break even for call contracts? Call up. So strike price plus yes. premium. I kind of like this question because I always say this. The key on these foreign currency questions is not to, you know, get uh flustered, is to say, okay, well, if it wasn't a foreign currency, what would the answer be? And uh, you know, it would be strike price plus premium. It still <laughs> is. Yeah, which is one, technically, if it wasn't in the spot, it'd be 172.50, but this yeah, is- Yeah, and you just move your decimal spot, two spots yeah. to the left. You don't even need to do that because you can pick whatever approximates your LED display. So I really like this question. It's an example of, don't go, oh my God, it's a foreign currency question. If you just stick with it and say, okay, well, I know what my break even is. It's strike price plus premium, right? Mm -hmm. Now that spot price, you know, just like when we're talking about stocks and options, in a speculative position, it doesn't matter where it's at when you do the trade. It matters where it's at when you close the trade. Now, right. if you pur purchase this British pound call, are you bullish or bearish on the United Kingdom? Um, you're purchasing a call. You're, you're 
bearish on the United Kingdom. Bullish. Sorry. Yeah, bullish. you're bullish, right? Because you're buying a call. <clears throat> bullish. Yeah, I so meant like, you know, uh, <laughs> United Kingdom finds oil in the North Sea or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. A customer writes an ABCD <laughs> October 220 call receiving a $11 premium. I like to buys out. one ABCD October 235 call paying a $3 premium. If both calls expire, the customer will realize. I like to write out my options. Oh, good, absolutely. You got time. You're not going to run out of time. You might run out of right answers, but not time. So I think it just helps get everything. Absolutely. You should have a process. It doesn't have to be my process. You know, everybody does options differently, uh, you know, well, but find one you like and stick, stick to it. You taught me options, so okay. yeah, I use a T. So I use there's two things that I'm a when I that are my mantra about teach options. I would like my students, like yourself, to ex, uh, understand contract specifications. Mm -hmm. I have an obligation to sell at two twenty, and a choice <laughs> to buy at two thirty five. Contract specifications. The other thing I'm a big stickler about is tracking money in and out, whether you use pluses or minuses or I like to use a T. I like to use dollars out versus dollars in. So, you know, whatever whatever floats floats your boat. I had a young lady, <laughs> she said she had her own method. I said, well, that's great, except it's not getting you right answers. So you need to change that method and figure it out. So I think the first step in this option is to um, be able to identify what it is. So is that's it right. What is it? Fred. It and it's a credit call spread. You are correct. It's a credit call spread. And so it says the contracts expire. So in credit spreads, is X, but contracts expiring good news or bad news if you have a credit spread? So it's um, good news. Yeah, because you get to go neener, neener, neener. So when, with a credit spread, your maximum gain is essentially your net premium. Which you is are absolutely correct. So your and choice is? It's definitely 800's profit, I believe. Yeah, uh, listen, I listen, young lady, very impressive. That was very impressive performance. You, the credit, harder, the harder credit thing. call spread, right? <laughs> Inspire. The other thing we want is the narrow, right? Mm -hmm. Our max gain is the premium. You nailed it. Our max loss would be, and this is where this is smart, right? Because if you just sold the 220 calls naked, you could make 11 and lose everything. Mm -hmm. Now you can make eight and lose seven. That's just a much better risk reward ratio. Uh, just because uh, you were uh, demonstrated your prowess in that question so well, uh, I'm going to continue to torment you on this question. What is the break even? The break even is 228. What'd you say? 228. Oh, so impressive. So impressive. And it's a bear. It was a credit call bear spread. Because That's you exactly oh. right. But you know what I like? You were a smart bear. You know, yeah. the other thing I always tell people is don't be a dumb bear. And if you're going to take some money from somebody, make sure you take it in a way that, you know, doesn't blow up on you. Mm -hmm. Under what circumstances will investor want to buy an ADR, an American Depository Receipt? Now, uh, I don't know of any draw of this Series 7. So, Sydney, I'm wishing for you a dream draw. Everything you studied shows up. Uh, however, you know, we got to be prepared for a face of death draw. But I don't know of any uh, exam or draw right. where you're not going to get asked about ADRs. Yeah. Um, under what circumstance? So you want to buy an ADR. He believes the dollar will become stronger and that buying an ADR will enhance the value of any dividends paid. This uh, is kind of a high end one. This is a little more sophisticated than the test. Sophisticated question for sure, just because I know that we would purchase an ADR for diversification purposes. That, that's exactly right. You should definitely know you're going to have currency risk, so you should eliminate D. So it's definitely not D. Um, he wants to avoid market risk. Um, so market risk is systematic risk, and you can't really like get rid of market risk. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So and now you're between A and B. Um, but I think he would purchase the ADR because if you realistically think about it, would the dollar become stronger? Or would the dollar become weaker? And that's why you're purchasing the ADR. The ADRs are in US dollars. Well, yeah. They, they, remember, they're conducting the business in the foreign currency. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so now we're asking under what circumstances would we be getting, you know, uh, be happy or sad based on turning those pesos to dollars. I'm really torn on this one. Yeah. And one of our test taking tricks, remember, is principle of mutual exclusion. So we we know that A and B say different things. They say the same thing at the end. It's just, do I think the dollar is going to become that, weak? That's exactly right. What you got to decide is what is going to be good news if I own an ADR? What happens to the dollar? Now, remember, there's a relationship between the dollar and the foreign currency. Right. right? So, so in my example, the ADR was Telefonos de Mexico. Uh, and they're asking it in hand. So that means they're asking me good news. So is the good news that the peso buys me more dollars because the dollar is weak? Or is the good news the pesos buy me less dollars because okay. the dollar is strong? That's kind of what I was wanting to remember. So they became they think the dollar will become weaker. Yeah, that was that was really, man, that's a high end kind of a question. That, I just like I didn't I should have realized this because it kind of also reminds me of options and like the import I, yeah i like that right epic exporters by puts importers by but call that would be exactly the other way we could have rat reasoned our way through it is say okay yeah, the inverse you know, relationship between yeah, that was a dollar i definitely think uh you're going to get tested on adrs and you're definitely going to get tested they have currency risk you're <laughs> definitely going to get tested on why would you add uh foreign investments including adrs to a portfolio because of the additional diversification perhaps different correlation uh, I thought this one was pretty tough. So uh, I don't know. Do we want to give STC kudos for throwing us one this hard? I don't know. That was, that, was good. Yeah. that was a good question. Yeah, I like it. I like it. For junk bonds, which of the following risks is of the greatest concern? Well, with every bond, you have inflation risk. Right on. Uh, realistically, only zero coupon bonds have a lot of, or they avoid reinvestment risk. But yeah, Excellent. 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 It's a great risk every bond has. I think it's default risk. Oh man, that would you know that sometimes when you nail things, I've told you that as your tutor. When you're when you're on, man, you are on. And, and boy, you hit that one out of the park. Uh, below what rating standard and poor is would a bond be considered a junk bond? Below which rating would a bond be considered junk under standard and poor's high yield? Um, well, the last rating for investment grades triple B. Excellent. Excellent. Double B and below. Yeah, excellent. Uh, the amortization of a natural asset over its expected useful life. A natural asset uh, over its expected useful life. So this is like a like a partnership question. It right? definitely is a partnership question. It is a definitely a partnership question. Um, wouldn't it be? amortization over okay so when something's i'm between a and b yeah i'm with you i'm with you i don't you, think it's c or d I'm, I, I'm with you we'll see we'll see i'm kind of with you because I, I think i you know like i say this is the first time that we're being exposed or i shouldn't say you because you have stc content i don't have stc content and so uh the first time i've seen the question on what my i'm what i'm pivoting on is this word natural asset and so natural makes me think, it's, and I could be wrong about this. I think oil and gas. Yeah. I, I'm thinking, uh, you know, a mining uh, partnership. I think we're definitely, it's a partnership question. Yeah. So if it didn't say natural asset, if it just said the amortization of an asset over its expected useful life, I would say depreciation. So how, I'm not sure. I'm with you. I think it's a 50 50. It's a 50 50 because also, like, I feel like depreciation depletion and depreciation are almost one in the same. <laughs> yeah. And the cost recovery system is dep depreciation as well. So kind of an odd question. So a uh, good I news, mean, uh, you're only going to get two or three partnership questions on the exam. So I, I always joke. I mean, if you tell me you missed these seven because of partnerships or margin, I'm going to say, eh, you know, maybe six. Know the others. Two years. So what are we going to squeeze the trigger on this one? I want to say like, okay, if something's depreciate i think depreciation if it's depletion then okay let's let's go for it and i have stc content it was yeah depletion. yeah see so i i so actually uh thought uh, it was going to be depletion because of the word natural right so here it goes depletion is considered the using up the wasting 
You know, and the way I, when I'm teaching this, I say the natural wasting asset. So I like depletion depletion because I got, I was on that pivot word natural and that was it. I wouldn't feel bad at all about this question, Sydney. I think this was another real tough one. I mean, uh, but I get a depletion allowance to give me an incentive to go find another barrel of oil, for example, or some more trees, right? So the way I think it is, if I don't know how many, much oil is down there, but I do know this, if I pump a barrel and I sell it, I got one barrel less. And so that depletion allowance is to give me an incentive to go find a replacement barrel. Now, my progressive friends, and I kind of with, with them on this, say, do we really need a tax incentive to go find more oil or gold or timber? Probably not, but you know, hey, you know, uh, oh well, tough one, tough that one. Was a, that was a bad miss for me, but. Yeah, okay. that's okay, that's okay. You know, that, start yeah, that, that, that was a tough one, that was a tough one. Uh, the pink marketplace, the pink marketplace displays all the trades involving OTC equity securities. The market makers for stocks are listed on NASDAQ. The designated market maker uh, on the definition. New York. The yeah, I'm sorry. The first one's like the definition of it. All, but oh. yeah, again, we got to be careful. All we, trades. All trades. Um, I think it's, uh, did, I'm going to say D. Yeah, you got to be careful, right? You got to be careful because all trades would include NASDAQ, right? So excellent. Thank God we're redeeming ourselves after that question. <laughs> yeah, well. That's part of the process. <laughs> uh, if a municipal bond uses a Western method of sharing risk, what liability does each have in relationship to the total issue? I like this question. So this is a good question. Um, Western is divided so you're only in charge of your own and mm -hmm. then Western is undivided. So you would have to like take a portion of the unsold. Um, uh, absolutely. That's exactly right. So I think it's A or B. A. Yeah. Well, right. The, the thing that makes B wrong is it says plus unsold bonds. No. Yeah. That, that we'd be dipping it up. We do reallocation. I like that one. And your, your explanation was exactly correct, right? I even have STC and I've never seen these questions before. So well, that's probably why they're selling them as supplements. Right? So, um, I think it's so what, $87 for the four of them. So uh, I didn't uh, show you the, uh, the menu screen before we started. Um, and I think maybe that's why it was those first couple of questions were kind of wobbly because I had opened on this, my other screen here uh, access, because I was going to go over that with you. Uh, so I think that's what was making kind of jiggly there in the beginning. But anyways, they say that you can customize these and sort them by, you know, whatever you want to do. So if you want to do more options or not that you need to do, it seems like you're pretty so, so far. I don't want to jinx us. You sound pretty tight on options. So, but you know, you could do, do options or munis or whatever. Uh, concerning arbitration, all the following statements are true, except. So correct me if I'm wrong, but when you, I just reread my arbitration, like the chapter involving arbitration. Mm -hmm. And I think mediation is binding, but arbitration is not. Uh, like, well, I think you got that uh, yeah. backwards. So mediation is not binding and arbitration is. Yes. So, okay. so I just want to make sure customer having a dispute with a broker dealer um, may use the arbitration procedure. Decisions may be appealed to FINRA. Um, disputes among members must go to arbitration. So I think A is true. That's true. I think C, obviously we just talked about it, is true. That's correct. A customer having a dispute with a broker dealer may go to arbitration. Um, I, I know that they talked about in the book, like, uh, like if you were to have like a sexual harassment situation and you were to go to arbitration, um, but I'm pretty sure, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but, um, yeah, arbitration is only for like people that work in the industry. Yes. Uh, and then customers have to agree to the process or, or it's not binding on them, but you know, but so customers could technically have a dispute with a broker dealer using yeah. arbitration. So the, it appealed to FINRA. I was leaning towards B. Yeah. Remember, there's no appeals. Decisions are final and binding. So just be careful. 
you know, there's there's a lot of people, I don't want to send out negative vibes, but there's a lot of people who uh, get mind meld. They put all this stuff in there and they confuse the cop, the code of procedure with the code of arbitration. Oh, is that what under I the card of, Under the code of procedure, you can appeal FINRA decisions under the code of procedure of the cop. But under the code of arbitration, no. Uh, do you know what the statute of limitations is for arbitration? Are you asking me like a... Yeah, a yeah. I'm just poking around your brain housing group as we go through these questions. Or is this like a day question? Like you're asking me a number? I'm asking you, I'm asking you, do you know what is the statute of limitations for arbitration? I feel like I know this and I'm just trying to think. I know the simplified like arbitration or something. Yeah, I, the, what I was looking for is six years. Oh, okay. Because so I, I would know the statute of limitation of arbitration. My mind just went everywhere. No worries, no worries, Sydney. I'm just, like I say, part of the process is uh, I like as your tutor to kind of poke around in your brain housing group as we're going through this and seeing what else is up there or what else is not up there. That My uh, mind know. just went into like simplified arbitration. I know, like, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. And then remember when I'm playing that game with you, I'm asking you to pull, pull, pull things out of the stratosphere and yeah. on the test, there's the answers in front of you like there was there. A high yield bond is generally associated high with. High yield is a junk bond. Right on, so... So what is a junk bond it got? Doesn't have a high credit quality, I'll tell you that. Boom, that's exactly <laughs> right. Rate. But it, that should be a layup, right? That should be a layup. Right, uh, and then not, remember, an easy question. yeah, I we got one. <laughs> we finally got an easy one. Um, <laughs> and then remember, there's two risks and bonds, interest rate risk and credit risk. And the credit mm -hmm. risk is amplified in a, a junk bond for sure. Yep. Excellent. A stock's breakout of a resistance level means the price of the stock. When you're breaking through resistance, you're bull. That's right. So now you got to translate to an answer. On the rise. Excellent. I tell you, when the stuff you're solid on, you are super solid on. Okay, so again, I'm being a jerk. So what kind of order might a technical analyst place above the resistance level to go long to go long i have to write this out like when we start talking about limit orders this yeah. is this is a weak point for me i don't know if okay well this is you know so the hint is i like what you said about writing i'm hoping you're writing slobs over bliss, bliss. that's what i just wrote because we need an order above the resistance level so a bullish breakout so so uh, it's slobs. It's going to be slobs. It's going to be over the market price. And now you got to decide, are you going to put a sell limit or a buy stop there? Is it a buy stop? Excellent. Excellent. See, I have to write it out. I have to visualize. Well, please do. Please do. <laughs> and a, if mediation is chosen as a means to settle a monetary dispute. The two parties may not withdraw and use arbitration instead. Two partners can withdraw, I think. Yeah, this one's pretty tough. I'm probably gonna get this wrong, I'm just gonna. Yeah, well, that's all right, that's okay. That's part of the process, well, you know. Um, only mediators from FINRA's, okay, that, anything with FINRA approved, I just take out. I like that, I like that. Um. Okay, partial settlement can be made through mediation and arbitration. I kind of like that answer because I don't really, mediation cannot be, okay, I think it's D. B is in boy? D. C is in Charlie? Uh, no, D is, is in boy. dog? I'm sorry, I'm, that audio is a little broad. I don't well, think mediation can be used if the arbitration process has okay, already- Okay, so mediation is chosen as a means to settle a monetary dispute. So what are we What are we picking, A, B, C, or D? I'm between C and D. Okay. I'm really between A. If it is A, then you know we can talk about it after. Okay. I don't okay. Think so pull, squeeze the trigger here. All right. I'm gonna go D. It's probably freaking A. That's <laughs> no. right. So C. you were yeah, you had the 50-50 right, right? So mediation is a process may allow parties. Some states require mediation before arbitration. The mediators can be chosen from the FINRA list, or it could be a mediator that two parties agree to. 
you know, there's they're like retired judges that make a very good living being mediators. The mediation can be started after arbitration has begun. And if there's a partial settlement, uh, that can uh, be the case. I, like uh, the I don't think this reflects anything you're going to see on your actual exam. So uh, my apologies to STC, but I don't think this is something I've ever had anybody tell me they've seen in terms of uh, test content. What is very testable is this idea that uh, the, the thing that people do encounter every once in a while is that the mediator can't be on the arbitration panel, which kind of makes sense because you know, the mediator is probably upset with you for not accepting the results of the mediation, right? And so. And then the arbitration panel has to have people that come from without. You get to, yeah, you get to choose public. If you want a completely public arbitration panel, you certainly can have that. Uh, okay. Which of the following is true concerning an original issue discount municipal bond? So when you have a discount bond, you are accreting it. That's correct. Um, the entire tick. Okay. Uh, it's not a. It is, you're correct. It's not a. The accreted discount is taxed as ordinary income if it's sold prior to maturity. Um, the accreted discount is received tax free if it's sold prior to maturity. Um, you and I have talked about this exact situation before because it's true. The entire discount is taxable as ordinary income if it's held to maturity. Yeah, the key here is it's a zero coupon bond, but the issuer is a municipality. So right. that's different than if this was an OID and the issuer was a corporation or OID is these otherwise known as zeros, or if this was a, for example, a treasury strip. So this is a unique and that it is an OID muni bond. So the imputed interest. It's tax free. Right on. Right. So that was a tough one. But remember, if this was any other thing, if this was any other thing, it would have been the accreted amount is taxed. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So good job. If that was a treasury strip or an OID, a uh, different one, that would be a different answer. Yeah, these questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, each of the following are benefits of a variable annuity, except. <clears throat> okay, unlimited contribution amounts. They don't have a limit on the contribution. That's per absolutely correct. That's one of their attractive features. And this is saying yeah. something that's not so, not true. Or not a bit. Row tax deferred, also true. That's true. Inclusion of a death benefit. Variable annuities do have a death benefit in the Excellent. Separate. Excellent. Tax deductible contributions. Right. You're using after tax money. Right. So you nailed it. A, B, C are all good things. And that one is not a good thing. Excellent. Wow. Uh, which of the following mortgage backed securities carries a full faith and credit guarantee from the U.S. Treasury? Now, as your tutor, I know you're not going to miss this. Jenny, my. <laughs> if you miss this on the actual exam, I think you're, you know, they should just fail you immediately. Your seat no should shoot you into the ceiling, Go right? Down. So Ginny yeah. Mae's very testable. This is a test question. They pay interest in principal monthly and they are fully taxable. Yes. And then Fannie yeah. Mae and Freddie Mac, those are exempt from state and local, right? Yeah, that's right. In fact, I like SDC's rationale here. Jenny Mays are the only pass through mortgage backed securities that are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States Treasury. Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have an implied guarantee. And then this, they go on to tell you about CMO. So, uh, what form of underwriting commitment allows the underwriter to op as an, operate as an agent for, agent for a newly agent. issued security? Agents get commissions principles get markup or mark down yeah you're you're on the right track and that would be in the secondary market so now we're asking about that same relationship as it applies to the primary market so i'm just gonna go through like mm -hmm. uh, so best yeah. efforts is you're you don't have to fulfill it all in one order um same thing with standby, 
all or none and firm commitment are a little more strict. I I'm leaning towards best efforts. When I tell you about your gut. You told me my gut is right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. I mean, you know. Yeah. See, going on, on the actual <laughs> test. So Cindy, on your actual test, uh, you know, when you're practicing like we're doing now, maybe, you know, you want to spend some more time on it. But uh, we, you don't want to be chewing up two things, time and energy that can make you tired later on and doing it. So uh, once you get, you, you know, your gut speaks to you, man, you want to you want to squeeze that trigger. If you watch, uh, you're trying to model good test taker behavior. You know, sometimes I recommend uh, people watch game shows and you can see the contestants who are good test takers, right? They don't they don't get wobbly and they answer pretty quickly. They don't, you know. They don't like, uh, well, who wants to be a millionaire? They're not phoning a friend at like for $200, right? They're going to go with what they've got. Firm I commitment, would... remember, would be where we would be acting in our dealer principal capacity. So, A, do you know what standby underwritings are used for? Um, the standby underwritings are like the um, agent or principal like waits yeah, standby and, underwritings are a form of a firm commitment underwriting used in a rights offering. Mm -hmm. So you say, hey, Dean, what happens if I don't uh, subscribe to the rights offering? I said, well, Sydney, you certainly as an existing shareholder, we can't make you maintain your proportion ownership. The issuer has hired an investment banker to stand by to uh, distribute the shares that our existing shareholders like yourself may not uh, do. So standby underwritings or a type of firm commitment used in a rights offering? That's a good question. Yeah, I like it. We got something that are pretty spot on. I, I, I know you watch Nico and I do. Uh, by the way, Nico passed his exam. Uh, oh, yesterday. great. For Anyways, him. I think you were watching Nico and I do a shared screen, a final for my metrics. And it was, it was, uh, uh, not, it, this is a good thing about this STC exam. We don't feel here, I haven't felt, I don't know how you feel as a test taker, that it's outer space. It's on the broad avenues and highways of the actual Series 7. That what Nick and I did, uh, it was <laughs> kind of, you know, a little off the beaten track in, in certain questions. So, so far, yeah, so... I was watching it and I was like, oh. It, <laughs> it was good content, just the way the questions were kind of... Well, well, and again, I kind of, I kind of joke, you get what you pay for, right? So with... Well, metrics, I think, for that, that those the whole shooting match, it was, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks. Uh, here it's 87. You're paying a little more money, but, you know, I joke, you get I mean, what you These are for. really good questions. Yeah, I like so far, so far, I like them. Uh, what's considered to be the estimated value? Uh, oh, here's another good one. I like this one as well. In the event the company is liquidated, the estimated value in the event the, cus the company is liquidated, wouldn't that be our? Working uh, market value, book value, par value. Um, would that be our book value? Yeah, right on, right on. I wish you could get rid of that little questioning in your voice, but yeah. Uh, par oh. value is an arbitrary <laughs> number we use to set up the books. You should definitely know that par value for bonds is a thousand. Yes. Par value for preferred stock is a hundred. I wouldn't worry about par, this. I wouldn't worry about par value for commons a dollar. You should know that market value is a supply demand relationship in the mm -hmm. secondary market. Yeah. And you should know that working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. And so you did indeed get that correct. That was kind of the thought process in my head. That uh, in a dispute between a registered rep and his employer, the dispute typically must be settled by arbitration. Yeah. Yeah. There is an exception to that. Do you know what that exception would be? Um, the exception of arbitration. Yeah. So you as an employee of the broker dealer. Mm -hmm. There is a scenario in which the employees of the broker dealer, the employees of Raymond James, will not be bound by arbitration. So when you signed your U4, you said, Sydney, that if you have a dispute with your broker dealer, you will go to arbitration unless your dispute is about. I don't remember this. I'm not going to uh, HR. I, I call it HR. 
I, know, I read sexual, all about it. Sexual harassment, <laughs> uh, racial discrimination, uh, uh, ageism, I don't know, whatever. The, what, name your HR issue, right? So in the HR issues, that goes to the normal human resource department, you know, thing, right? These are good questions. Yeah. This year, a college student's grandparents gifted 30000 into her 529 plan. If paid by the grandparents, which of the following would be subject uh, to the gift tax? I'm pretty sure all of it would be subject to the gift tax. Well, we 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 know but, it can't be all of it, so we're going to have to kind of work our way through it and come up with a uh, you know. It says a college student's grandparents gifted thirty thousand into her five twenty nine plan. Isn't the gift tax seventeen thousand as of? It this is. Month? This might be an older question, but let's just assume that you know. But thirty, if if it's it's you're correct, but that means thirty would still be not a problem based on the old rule because it would be the same. Okay, if the plan, which of the following could be subject to the gift tax? A monetary gift to a political organization, a payment of 10,000 for the student's medical expenses, $12,000 room and board expense for the student's education board, or a direct payment for the tuition. Yeah, so this is a tough one. This is a tough one just because what I know about the gift tax is that they're both allowed to contribute if they're mm -hmm. married. So mm -hmm. technically say when this question was That's written. Right. 15,000 each. They're both able to contribute that per year. You could do a lump sum payment of up to five years. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and I'm pretty sure with the 529s, if you were to trying to think. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's going to have any implications for you on the actual exam because I think the actual exam is very much what you just said are the test uh, things and that 529s are way better than Coverdale's. Uh, so thing about like, if I was to pull the 30s out, if I was to, what was I going to get taxed on? Like, I'm pretty sure what you put in would be taxed, which up to my knowledge, I would assume would be like all of it. It would come out taxed. I mean, unless it's for qualified expenses. That's exactly right. I mean, everything you said is true. So we just got to squeeze the trigger on one of these and, and know that, you know, Hey, here's one of those funky questions. We just jinxed ourselves. Right. So now we got one of these funky questions that is not on the broad avenues and highways of the actual uh, Series 7, but, you know. What would be, I mean, a monetary gift to a political organization? That's an odd one. I don't know if they're just baiting with this. I mean, that looks so odd to me. It's, it's like, room and board. this is where I, like, even you're, me, I'm overthinking that. just so odd to me that I'm thinking either it is the right answer or it's a hell of a distractor because it's got my brain kind of like going, oh. <laughs> when you think about it, that's the one answer out of all these other answer choices that's like so out of left field because soon- Okay, so we want to hit it and we want to see if that's it? I mean, yeah, I guess. I would get this wrong anyway. Oh, uh, there we go. So we missed it. Uh, individuals may give a gift of 18000 17000 2023 per person and avoid paying the gift tax. We've said that. I think more importantly, they can be front loaded five years was your point. Uh, married couples may give up to 36,000, 18 times two, because the grandparents already have given 30 to their child's 529. Paying an additional 12,000 room and board would take them over the gift limit. So we were focused on the wrong thing here. I totally overthought this. Yeah, we, me too. So 30 plus 12 is where the key on the question was 42. Okay. All right, STC, you got but it. Awesome. You, I like didn't us. think that it was eighteen thousand. I thought it would. The test is going to test us on seventeen. I mean, I don't think the test will have any of these numbers in there because they don't want to go into the Q bank and keep adjusting things that move. So on these questions like uh, IRAs and uh, UPMAs and gift tax, they really fly high because they don't want to have to go in there and change it. So I don't think, as I said when we first encountered this particular STC question. Uh, this is, uh, I don't think, something you're going to encounter on the actual exam, but, you know, you know, oh, well, right? Yeah, that was a good question. Gotta yeah, tough, it. tough. Oh, God. Oh, boy. I know you're not going to miss this. That's the first time. As, this is very testable. There is no draw in which this does not show up. It's on the SIE. It's on the Series 7. It's on the Series 24. And the key phraseology, <laughs> as the first transaction. So in her margin account, a customer buys 2,500 of ABC stock. 
how much cash must she deposit? Okay, so I know this rule and I'll let you know it really quickly. Just mm -hmm. so, so with a short account, you have to deposit minimum 2000. That, and that's right. That's correct. I marry like a first transaction from it's 50% zero to 2000. Like it's half two to 4,000. It's two over 4,000. It's half. That's right. So where does this fall into what you just said is correct. And that's the key to this question. So half of that would be 1250, right? But it says first transaction. So 2000. Yeah, right. you just told you just told me the right answer when you walked me through it, right? Yeah. So boom. That is oh, that is definitely, definitely on the test. Uh rising interest rates will generally affect existing bondholders by. So if the interest rates are rising, the bond prices are going down. You got it. What kind of relationship is that called? Inverse relationship. Yeah, very testable. We assume everybody in the securities industry knows that, right? I always joke, if anybody ever asks you about economics, finance, or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. If they ask, what about them? You say they fluctuate. I say, is that good news or bad news? You say it depends. And you tell me more. Uh, oh, I like this. I like this. Which of the following is generally the largest portion of an underwriting spread. Another good one, another good one. The largest portion of the underwriting spread. They didn't ask me for the largest individual portion, right? Well, you don't even have that available. So I think it's a fair question. So I usually tell people, be careful whether you're being asked about an individual component or not, because the answer could vary. But I, I like this because STC has tightened this answer set. The only other thing you could have answered here is not available to you. So, so selling concession. Uh, right on, right on. And, and what I was hinting at that's not available to you is the total takedown. The total takedown. So the selling concession and the additional takedown. The um, total, yeah, that's right on. So the additional takedown and the selling concession are two components in munis. And those two components together are the total takedown. What is the smallest portion of the underwriting spread? They also could have been the test um, Manager's fee. Excellent. And our selling concession, if that's all you got, your firm got the selling concession, period, full stop. Are you at risk, your firm at risk for unsold securities? Uh, the selling concession is not, or the selling. Yeah, group. selling group members are never liable for unsold securities. Right. right. So uh, I, I like this question. Uh, components of the spread, right up. In stocks, the additional takedown is called the underwriting fee. Yes. The underwriting fee. So uh, good question. Good question. I like that. This is a good test. Uh, by the way, there's a question on the actual exam where you're, they tell you that your firms remember the selling group and the concessions are half a point. And then they tell you that your your firm sold X number of bonds and then you've got to come up with how much compensation. So the spread stuff is very testable. And I really, uh, this is one of my favorite questions thus far that STC asked. Uh, to qualify for favorable tax treatment, what percentage of a REIT's uh, income must come from real estate income? Oh, kind of tricky here. I think it's, I'm between 90 and 75. Yeah, I, you're you're correct, right? So be careful, those RTFQ. It's not asking us about the pass-through. So 90% is the pass-through. Yeah, and it doesn't about the pass-through. It says, if you call yourself a REIT, right? Mm -hmm. you call yourself yeah. a REIT, you got to have at least 75% mm -hmm. in uh, real estate investments. So that, by, that's why it was at 90, that right? If it would have said how much they must pass through... It'd be 90. Yeah, yeah. So. 90, 10, and then 75, 20. Yeah, yeah. All those could have been right answers, different things for sure. <laughs> you know? Under I mean, what circumstance is a company required to pay dividends to preferred stockholders? Under what circumstance is a company required to pay dividends to preferred stockholders? Preferred stockholders take priority over common. That's right. So, 
a company is always required to pay dividends to preferred. A company is only required if it also paid. So B is false. If dividends are paid to common, then all preferreds must been must be paid in full. C could be it, but I think it's if they have positive net. Um, is they're always required to pay dividends to preferred stockholders. Um, sorry that I'm taking a while on this question. Well, I know no, but remember, no, that's okay. As your tutor, I don't have any problem. I talked to one of our celebrities on the channel is Lauren and Lauren, oh man, she, she took forever. But you know, she got it right and she passed her test. So I don't care about that. What I do care about though, as your tutor is what do we say about your gut? My gut's always right. Yeah, that you do, you know you, you when you are ready to squeeze a trigger, you know you should squeeze because you did have the right answer, and now we're, you know, I don't know where you're at right now, but you know. Oh, when I said like if dividends are paid to common, then they have to be paid in full. Yeah, I mean that that's boom, you know. So. Yeah, because I knew that if you are um, a preferred stockholder, needs to get paid first. So Always. I mean it's very. Preferred. Worded kind of different, but that was correct. This is a, this I, I like this question. It's different phraseology, but I like the takeaway. I like what they're getting taking away from the question. And you were correct that preferred stock has preferential treatment in two areas: dividends. You can't pay a dividend to common if you're going to rearrange the preferred stockholder. Now, I, the way that C says that is kind of funky, but that's what C is basically saying. And then you have preferential treatment and liquidation. So. Uh, very much a, uh, I, you know, again, I don't particularly care for this phraseology, but the takeaway is very, very testable. Uh, variable universal life insurance contains which of the following features? Okay, so when we're talking about variable annuities versus fixed, fixed mm -hmm. is the one that offers the guaranteed cash value. That's right. Because the variable can... They have a guaranteed death benefit, though, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think, you know, it, it's likely you get no questions on variable universal life, and it's possible you get one. It's very low probability. Uh, the one that shows up that people tell me they see is a hypothetical illustration can only go up to 12, and then it has to have a, a zero in it, which is kind of stupid, but, you know, for whatever reason, that sometimes shows up. Paid in full premiums at a specified date, interest, guaranteed interest rate, and a variable death benefit. I don't think the death benefit, I mean, I think it's a guarantee. I'm between A and B. Yeah, okay. Fixed premium, guaranteed cash value, and guaranteed death benefit. I don't know. I'm also... I'm like, I'm between A, B, and D. I do not think it's C. Yeah, you know, remember, too, we're, we'll see how we do on this uh, mark that we're getting. But as I said, I would like you to, Sydney, be in a place of abundance where questions like this, you say, yeah, whatever. Okay, so I'm just going to go me. whatever. Um, okay. I'm going to go D because I'm pretty sure the death benefit is variable. Like, it could go up or down, but she does get a guaranteed death benefit, so I don't know. So, yeah. yeah, I would have gone with flexible because that's... I would have gotten this wrong anyways. That's all right. The variable means flex that you have flexibility in terms of uh, funding it. Okay. Right? So, oh, you know what? I didn't even read that correctly because yeah, variable cash value is accurate. Variable death benefit is yeah. what I was saying. And then the yeah, flexible. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. I wouldn't worry about it. But So variable life insurance uh, makes no guarantees. The owner has the option to increase, reduce, or skip premium. That's the main point. That's why okay. it's called variable. I wouldn't feel bad about that at all. Oh, my favorite. Thank God. Whew. Yeah, you're pretty good at this. Uh, let's see if uh, we can continue on with your expertise. An investor's long 1DEF April 50 call and short 1DEF June 40 call. This position is referred to as a... This is a calendar spread. Okay, so, but that's not available to you. So now what are you going to do? Calendar is, I think it's, um, is calendar the horizontal or the diagonal? Um, so everything is different here. You got different strikes and you got different months. Right. 
Is it a diagonal spread? What I tell you about getting rid of that uh, lisp in your questioning in your voice, right? <laughs> it's not going to be a vertical because vertical would be a price spread that you're an expert at. It wouldn't be horizontal. Horizontal would have been the calendar spread. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. So and horizontal it, it, would be just a different the diagonal. Is it's a com? It's not a combination because it doesn't have different. It's not a column. Exactly. But, exactly. Okay, yeah. right. So when everything's the way I think of it, I know it's helpful. When everything's different, the strikes and the months uh, diagonal. I I have a video where I show a quote screen on that way and show why it is vertical or diagonal because it's how it lays out on a quote screen. But yeah. Also, a, a brokerage firm would like to increase its marketing efforts in auctions transactions through the use of certain retail communications. All the following methods are considered forms of retail communications, except. This is a good question. Yeah, I kind of like it. I was looking for, uh, the way I was thinking we would attack this is by knowing that retail communications is uh, more than 25. Right. So newspapers and magazines, more than 25, radio, telephone messages, and television, uh, sales material, research reports would be retail. I mean, the options clearing disk disclosure document is what's kind of sticking out to me, but also just the C is also sticking out. To, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Because the OCC isn't part of our advertising, right? Right. Right. This is something we get. So I would have done that. You were right to think of this as tw more than 25. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, open accounts and do things. We don't send out the OCC as a marketing piece. That's like part of our, our process. Right. But, yeah. Now we have in all those communications, by the way, we would have to offer you the options clearing uh, the disclosure documents. Say, hey, you know, we're more than happy to send this to you. Uh, if I open the account, I give you the OCC disclosure document, then I get your account approved. Uh, then you can do your first trade. How long do you have to get back to us the option agreement that you read and understood that document? Isn't it 15? Right on. If you don't get it back in time, then what are we going to tell you? <laughs> Only closing transactions, right? Yeah. Uh, which of the following statements about cumulative preferred stock is true? Um, dividends and arrears will be paid before common dividends. Oh man, on the tough you, stuff you are solid on, you are really solid on. Some of the questions are just, obviously you deal with this on the actual exam, but some of the questions just kind of really like. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, some of these are spot on. I, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, I feel bad for Nico that we didn't have SDC permission to do this because this is a little better. Uh, well, I should say it's a lot better than that metrics. Uh, FINRA uh, cannot impose uh, prison sentences. Yeah, good news, right? So they call you say, hey, you can't throw me in jail. I don't suggest you say that. But... All righty. If a client makes a written request for her broker-dealer to hold all correspondence, how long may the broker-dealer honor that request? Um, okay, well, I know that you can hold mail for up to three months, which would be 90 days. Well, I know if you want to extend that, can you do it for convenience? Um, I didn't really read anything about extending it past the three month period. Yeah, it, it can't be for convenience. So it could be like for security. So at three months come, I always tell the story like I'm traveling in the Philippines or something. I say, and you say, well, then you can get electronically. I said, well, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is like, go into an internet cafe and, you know, look, punch up my brokerage account. It moves me up on the kidnap list. Right. For a stock trade, the regulation T payment is described as. T plus two. Yeah. I, oh, I think, wait, no, it's T plus four. I'm I so sorry. I was going to say. I know it. I caught myself. Yeah, you caught yourself because remember customers get two additional days. We don't it actually tell them that because. Right. We don't want to use our money to settle their trade, but they actually get two additional days. Um, if the customer doesn't pay us in T plus two plus two, uh, we don't have to get them an extension, but we do. But if we sell them out, in other words, they didn't pay, they buy and then we sell them out, they bought and sold without paying, what do we do there to account if they buy and sell without paying for the buy? They buy and sell without paying. They took a free ride. Yeah, they free wrote. And we freeze their account for? um 90 days. Right, or... right on. Oh, great. Okay. 
Uh, soft dollar. So which of the following is not acceptable under soft dollar relationships? So soft dollar compensation is paid by a broker or dealer to an investment advisor. Yes, it's for the benefit of like the... That's right. That's exactly right. So, you know, we have common clients. You're, my client on my investment advisory firm is also a client of the broker dealer. Providing subscriptions to industry paid publications, providing third party research, providing in house research, providing software for accounting services. Um, I'm between, I'm like, I'm leaning towards like providing the third party research. Well, you know, the I, I think the way to attack this I'm is all- Sesame Street trick. Which one of these things? does not help the clients of the investment advisory firm who are both clients of the investment advisory firm, the broker dealer. Would that be the providing software for accounting services? Yeah, that would have to be, if we're providing that, it has to be something that benefits. There's nothing there that tells me that's helping me do portfolios or anything like that. Uh, I don't think it'll be this difficult on your exam. (laughs) That's a hard question, but it's It's a good one. Very hard, but the other things do help me help my clients. Yeah. Right? So the there's no context there, but the big one is make sure we don't we don't use soft dollars can't be used to pay for travel, furniture, or rent. Right. So this I one was that. a tougher version of that for sure. Okay. Municipal fund securities. Those are five twenty nine plans. Yeah, and local government investment pools. Yes. Um, issued by a state or local government. Required to register with SEC, subject to federal taxes, regulated under the Investment Company Act. Um, I think regulated um, or register, they have to register with the, are they subject to federal tax? Yeah, they are, I think. Um, I'm between C and D. Yeah, uh, and uh, one of those is going to be a really bad miss if you say it, and the other one's the right answer. No pressure. Pressure. I'm trying to think municipal fund securities. Is it because if you register under the Investment Company Act, you're a mutual fund, a face certificate, or a closed end? Um. I like, I'm leaning towards C, but my gut. What I tell you? you Wait, know. you picked B. Oh, yeah. The, the reason something. that would have been a terrible mess <clears throat> is because you should definitely know that municip- municipal securities, municipal issues are exempt from registering. They don't have to register with anything. The Investment Company Act, the SEC, right? That's municipal right. securities, whether it's a municipal right. bond or municipal fund, they use official statements, right? So... That's why I was saying C would have been a bad mess. Yeah. Oh, thank God. A convertible bond has a conversion price of 50. This is about as easy as a convertible question as you're going to get. It's 20 to 1. Yeah, good job. Good job. Thank God. Oh, well, you're doing fine. <laughs> These questions have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, which of the following permits existing stockholders to buy a proportionate number of additional shares of a new issue before the stock is offered to the public. Preemptive rights. Yeah, boom. And those rights are short-term or long-term? Rights are long-term short-term, long-term. warrants are long-term, rights are at a discount, warrants are uh, at a premium. Right, right, right. Okay. So. Um, let's see, I love options questions. Yeah, you do a great job on options. The client has the following option positions, long one ABC, November 45 call at eight and short one ABC November 55 call at two. What type of spread does the client have? A debit call spread, which is bullish. Oh my goodness. That is so impressive. Uh, Just because, you know, you're so good at it. Uh, Do you want these contracts to expire or do you want these contracts to be exercised? Uh, debit widen, ex uh, debit widen expire credit narrowness or exercise. Right on. Do you want the premiums? The difference in the premiums, which is now six, 
Yeah. Do you want that difference to widen or narrow? Get larger widen. or smaller? widen. Right on. What is your max loss in this debit spread? 600. Right on. What is your max gain? Uh, 400. Excellent. Excellent. That was all mental. I didn't even <laughs> grab paper out. No, no, listen, you're really good. I, yeah, I'm just hoping that you get a draw with lots of options. I mean, that's you a great to place to be. Nine, ten instead. Yeah, that'd be a great place to be, <laughs> right? If you're something you're good at and you get, you know, lots of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's hope, right? Let's hope. Uh, what type of bond issued by a municipal bond qualifies as a private activity bond, but may not provide tax exempt interest to certain investors. I don't like the way, uh, I like this question, but I don't like the answers they're offering to you because on the actual test, it'll be a little more straightforward about what kind of bond it is. Is the AMT bond? Yeah, no. remember okay. what kind of bonds are those? So we, we should know those revenues. are industrial development revenue bonds. Yeah, the revenues are subject uh, to the AMT and the, G, uh, the GOs are subject to the ad valorem. Yeah, yeah, GOs, you have no AMT complications with a GO bond. The right. revenue bond, you may have a AMT complication if you're sub to the AMT and in supporting a private activity. Uh, what type uh, What type of plan is the <laughs> deferred compensation plan? That's unqualified, right? Yeah, it depends on how you're getting that from your, uh, uh, your employer. But yeah, you're typically indeed using after-tax money. Yeah, they're non-qualified deferred right. comp plans right. and we can discriminate excellent yep uh, an investor purchases 100 shares of abc common stock at 20 later the investor sells the shares at 23 for both the purchase and sale a commission of two percent was applied to determine the gain you know, the gain on the sale what's the total cost basis for the investor's share this is a yeah, this is kind of, uh, I don't think this is legit. I, but I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I don't think you're going to encounter this. On the test, you would say 2000 but now yeah, they're adding into this 2% commission. And I don't they're know. asking you, does the, what this is getting to is, do you get to include the 2% commission as part of your cost basis? If you say yes, it's going to be different than if you say no to that question. Right. I do not think that we would include the commission in the cost basis. I think that would be added to the total after, but I could be wrong. You are indeed wrong. So oh. that's one of the things I used to, when I was a practitioner say, Sydney, yeah, you are paying me a $40 commission. Okay. But that's going to be part of your cost base. Now, how did I get the 40 bucks? I just took my calculator. 2000 times. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to ask you that, you know, that the cost base you can cap, the, the, the term for this is you can capitalize the commission into the cost basis. So, yeah, you know. I just got confused with this question because it reminds me of that one question that I had where it was like the print, the riskless principal question or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't remember, we'll find something like that on this, right? So, yeah, I, I so, don't know. But sometimes that happens, right? Well, so, brain takes you down a road <laughs> yeah that's where it went. <laughs> that happens to me every once in a live stream and i'm doing a live stream and somebody will, will give me an acronym and i think it's the acronym i think it is and, and so i'm answering and i realize oh no no they they didn't mean it in that it's a different <laughs> so, i deserve to get that wrong uh, an investor purchased 200 shares of stc at 35 and subsequently purchases two stc january 35 puts at two so this if is the uh, puts expire. What is the investor's profit or loss? So you bought a stock and then you also purchased two puts. This would be a protective put. That's exactly what it is. So what is the investor's profit or loss? So on a protective put, the profit is normally uh, unlimited. That's so Correct. But remember here, it says the puts expire. So you still have the long stock position and you no longer have the puts. Okay. So, so I'm going to find out my break even first. That's usually how I like okay. to do that. That's fine. Okay. So 35. Um, okay. So 35 and then four and then 35. 
So 39. So I think it's going to be the $400 uh, loss. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Because that, that, that becomes a separate transaction at the point that it expires. That's the premium. That's I just like to write my, especially like. Listen, do, do that. You listen, listen, you are really good at options. So whatever you're doing is working. So you don't want, when you get to the exam uh, and our, you know, our mock here today, you want to do what you're going to do on the exam. And so you, you want to have that process. So, you know, stay disciplined in doing just that. Don't, don't get out of your, your process. Cause once you get out of your process, then you can start getting a little wobbly. I had a guy, the guy's a very, very, very bright guy. And one thing I was very impressed with is, you know, cause he, he is very capable of doing things in his head. But even on the basic option position, he was still committed to the process. He write his thing and do his thing. And, you know, and I, you know, I thought it was pretty impressive that he stuck to his process. The other reason I'm such a stickler for that process is because if you have a process, it doesn't have to be deans. It could be STCs. It could be whatever, whoever, you know, teaching you options. I know Hoffman does it in a funky way. But anyways, my point is, if you have a process too, sometimes you can self uh, do course correction you'll catch yourself doing making a mistake. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have a process, you made a, make a mistake and you don't even know you made one. You're just, you feel good and you're moving on to the next performance opportunity. Uh, a spread in which the cost of purchasing the option is less than the amount received from selling the option is referred to... Um, so you per... So the, they're technically telling me that my dominant option. Yeah, they're saying the purchasing of the option contract is less. less. So they're saying that the selling it was more, which would mean we had a credit spread. Excellent. And what would be your max gain on that credit spread? Your net premium. Yeah, right on, right on. Excellent. You're pretty damn good on the advanced option strategies. <laughs> Hopefully my test is built. Uh, which of the following securities is exempt from state taxes? I like this. Um, the federal national treasury notes are subject. They're exempt from Fed, but subject to state. Or maybe I confused that. Just give me one moment. I'm between. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I, okay, so maybe, uh, maybe I confuse that. Maybe I'm asked backwards on that. <laughs> so I think they're exempt from state and subject to federal. So treasury. Yeah, good job. I like it. So th that's kind of what we were talking about. What's really good is that when you, you get to where you're at with the base knowledge, which I think Sydney is where you're at is, you know, a good spot. When you get good, again, you did your self-correcting, right? You were able to correct yourself and say, well, maybe, not, you know, and you, you kind of did a course correction there. Which is I, great. I mean, if you if you don't have enough base knowledge, you you, you can't do course correction because you don't know you're wrong. I always compare the following statements is true regarding dividends in arrears for cumulative preferred stock. Uh, a they must be paid in full before common stockholders receive dividends. Yeah, you know, I get a lot of uh, people on debrief who tell me they had more preferred uh, <laughs> stock questions than they were expecting, and I don't know what to make of that because I go, well, gee, I don't. How much were you expecting, <laughs> right? So, uh, by the way, one more uh, uh, compliment to uh, STC here. Usually when I'm doing these on a shared screen, as you know, I have to blow up the screen to get the the, the thing to show up. And I, I do like, I don't know who the person does this, but uh, I do like that STC's format is one question per screen. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, we're not having to shrink it or blow it up to kind of see what's going on. Exactly. Uh, confirmations on transactions must be sent. I think this is a good question, mm -hmm. um, but I'm pretty sure confirmations for transactions. I'm just thinking of like day-to-day -day work life. Like, mm -hmm. or, yeah, or, I like that. Um, it's not A or B. Uh, both written and electronic, either written or electronic form. I, I'm going to go with, I think I'm going to go with C just because I think if you do send it out, it has to be an electronic form for like processing. If it's yeah. like either yeah. or. Yeah, I think you're going to miss this. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, because the whole point, we don't want to kill the trees if it's not necessary. So, you know, I say, Sydney, you know, do you want an electronic form? So it's either. Okay. That's what I was thinking. And the only reason I took it back was because I was like, okay, if you're sending something out in written form, like realistically for like record keeping purposes, mm -hmm. sometimes that could get lost in translation. And like, well, it's listen, I told you, you know, uh, I guess it's a, on some days it's a good thing. And some days it's a bad thing that you are uh, <laughs> too smart for your own good. You're outsmarting yourself. Right. So yeah. that's the downside of having, uh, you know, enough brain power to do that. And so everything you said is makes sense, but you know, don't, don't uh, bring extra stuff in there. If a municipal revenue bond has a gross revenue pledge, a gross revenue pledge. That service this, is before operational expense. You know, and uh, where would you find that? Excellent. What, where would you find that? What document would you find out whether it's a net revenue pledge or a gross revenue pledge? Trust indenture. Excellent. 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 Wow. Uh, here we go. You love these options. Mr. Jones buys an R X R X October 50 <laughs> put when the market price is also 50. Who cares? Pays a premium of five. If XYZ declines sharply and he exercises his put, what is his maximum profit? Okay. And it pays a premium of five. Okay. So that's if that right. is an XR, October 50 put premium five. If XR declines sharply and he exercises the put, that would be his premium. What is the maximum profit? So is Mr. Jones a bull or a bear? He bought a put. He's a bear. And so if you're a bear, what do you want the stock to do? You want it to go down. How far down could it go? To zero? 45? Right. Yeah. I think it's 45. Yeah. Because it's the All break right. even. Yeah. Break even to zero or strike price and less premium to zero. Yeah. yeah. I like I, I, I like how they buried this in the... <laughs> but it's really just a question what's the max gain on a long put so all that other stuff there is just to confuse you the best case is i make somebody give me 50 dollars for worthless stock mm -hmm. so you say dean you're making me pay 50 dollars for worthless stock i go yes you say i'm gonna lose five thousand dollars i go no you get to keep the premium you're only gonna lose forty five hundred dollars you say man you're so good at my loss i go because well, it's my gain the best case is i get to stick it to somebody Put it to somebody at 50 when the stock is zero. 51. Now, now be careful because, you know, you're so good on those advanced options that, you know, they've got you were a little wobbly on the, the basic. The small option. ones really get to me sometimes. Right. And yeah. investors in a 28% tax bracket. I like this. Which of the following investments would provide her with the best tax advantage? Now, I'm just, I'm kind of lazy. So I'm just shopping this to see if perhaps I can, you know, just take a guess without doing the tax-free tax or tax equivalent. We're between the corporate and the municipal. Yeah, I think that would be where I would attack. I'm just like leaning towards the municipal, but. Yeah, and you know, and again, this, we want to be, have abundance. What I mean by that is, you know, I think it's going to be the municipal, but uh, the this municipal guy... gives me a 6.94. Yeah, I was gonna. I'm just, just gonna do the math really quick. Yeah. So, and then uh, the corporate bond would give me. We know the corporate. By the way, I I just I do think it's gonna be mean because I'm just looking at the five and three quarters. And it's gonna be less than that because you're paying taxes. Yeah. Right. The preferred stock is gonna be less than six and a half because you're paying taxes. Mm -hmm. The six and three quarters. So I don't even think we have to deal with a. Yeah. I think you know, and then we could do the if we're gonna do the uh, muni. We just did the Muni 6.94, mm -hmm. but we would take 5.34, which is 57.50, uh, right? Five and three quarters. And we would say times uh, 0.72, uh, six and a half times 0. 0.72, 65 times, uh, or six and a half dollars times that, and six and three quarters uh, times that. You're definitely going to have to do tax-free equivalent or taxable equivalent. I don't think you're going to have to do four times to get one point, but. So that's 4.14 for the corporate bond. Is it? I think. Okay, so. Not 100%. It's now out. So the corporate bond's out. So now you got the preferred stock and convertible to deal with. 
By the way, I would have I would have just taught just, you know, again, we're, we're just talking as we work our way through it. I would have tossed out a Sydney just because I know that five, I just did the 5% taxable equivalent was 6.94. And so I know that that five and three quarters is a number that's going down. Mm -hmm. right? Because you're not you're paying taxes. So it's going to be less than five and three quarters. I know the six and a half is going to be less. It's going to go down because you're you're paying taxes and the six and three quarter is going to be less because it's a lower number. The B is a higher number. The taxable equivalent yield is higher than five. And I know the tax-free equivalent on A, C, and D are going to be lower than the numbers they're showing me. Yeah, I'm going to go B. Yeah, let's see. We got, you know, boom, right? Yeah. So uh, the 5%, let's see if uh, they told us we could have skipped all that. I think they just no, wanted to- I like to it. See, they're saying, I like what STC said. They said the shortcut that I was sharing with you, how I would have attacked it is what they say. And this question, the municipal bonds was 6.94. And that's how I attacked, right? And then I told you, I'm just shopping the answer set. And I'm looking that there's nothing, all those other numbers are not going to be higher. They're going to be lower. So this return exceeds the return of any other choices. Boom, done. I like that. That was a good question. I like that one. That was a good question. I like that one. Uh, which of the following statements is true if a company intends to raise capital in an initial public offering that's being issued entirely online? Entirely online. Mm. Mm. This is a good question. I yeah, you know, uh, it's it fun to do these hard. STC questions because sometimes I'm not sure when in my live stream on uh, Tuesday nights, uh, you know, people are using Kaplan, Past Perfect, uh, Training Consultants, Nopman, STC. And sometimes they have got questions and this came up and I'm not sure it's because they saw it on the exam if they tested before or just an STC question. And my guess is uh, this person who was asking this in my live stream probably encountered this question uh, on STC supplemental exams and hence his, uh, his question. His question to me was, do I need to be registered to you know, accept uh, money uh, or be a broker dealer or an agent of a broker dealer to raise capital and IPO for an issue? And the answer, absolutely. There's no you know, exemption based on, on this. I think he was asking about crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. This is a good question, and I'm going to completely guess on this because I just don't really. So what's your best guess? Uh, the... the investments can made or, through you know, what? broker. What's that? Um, I'm going to take it back. Um, I'm between B and D. Maybe. I'm just going to go... The funds be sent directly to the issuer. Um, with a primary transaction. Um, I'm gonna go D, and if I get it wrong, I deserve to get it wrong because I. Well, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up. Okay, online. Right. Yeah, they gotta have a broker dealer involved. I mean, there's no exemption there, so. Uh, I, I don't think that you're going to encounter this on the actual Series 7. I think this is more of a leading kind of a question mm -hmm. uh, about online offerings. And so um, I would defer to SDC if this is something they're asking as kind of what they think might be tested in the future or whether somebody's at. I haven't had anybody on debrief tell me they've received on the actual Series 7 anything about crowdfunding or doing uh, things online. Uh, but uh, boom. But you were in a pretty good role. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. According to SRO rules, an email message complaining about excessive commissions sent to the RR's personal electronic device. So it is a complaint and it must be forwarded um, to the appropriate cell SRO. I don't think you have to forward complaints. It just goes to the principal. An email is a written complaint. It so is certainly a written complaint. So yeah, you could toss out. It's not a complaint. Yeah. 
Um, must be followed up with 10 business days by a written document from the client to be considered an official complaint. That's not right. That's right. So it's B or C. And when I'm thinking of the SRO, that's like the SEC or FINRA. Well, let's be clear. The FINRA SEC FINRA. is not an SRO. Yeah, I'm sorry. FINRA is who I'm thinking FINRA, of. Yeah, when you need to put forward things. complaints to FINRA. So uh, B or C? C. I'm sorry? C. C is in Charlie? Yes. Okay. It's actually uh, B. Oh, no, you got it right. Good job, right? We do. We don't forward the complaints, but we do keep a quarterly thing. So good job. Uh, I would prefer they had an answer set that said something like, you know, give it to your supervisor or something like that. Like the principal. It doesn't That's go right. to. Yeah, right. records of customer complaints must be maintained. That's We knew that. That is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, remember what uh, what is the record retention on customer complaint? Do you know what the record retention Four is? Four years. Excellent. Unless it's MSRB, MSRB would be six. Yeah. And then we do make a quarterly filing about complaints with FINRA. Yep. Uh, Harriet purchased a thousand shares of the overseas growth fund several years ago for nine dollars a share. The shares are now worth twenty two five. Harriet gives the shares to her nephew as a college graduation present. What is Bob's cost basis for the shares? This is very testable. So when you die, it's the date of the death. That's right. Your cost basis. That's right. So this would be, this is a gift. So you're inheriting it. So I'm pretty sure it might be nine. Boom. Very much a test question. Okay. Right. And you're right. If it was if it was dead and he inherited it, it would be the 2250. Excellent. Right. Mm -hmm. so the step up uh, very much a test question. Either they're dead or they're alive. So the way you process that was perfect. A small company would like to raise capital through a private placement in order to expand its operations as an investment banking representative working on the deal. You would be least likely to target which of the following investors when offering these securities? Senior, this is like asking me about like, um, I think accredited like investors. That's exactly where you should be thinking. That's exactly the right thing to think about. So least likely. Would so they're asking like, you which one of these uh, is least likely. Which would be like existing shareholders who are employees because that doesn't tell me anything about their net worth. Like well, senior when, when you are spot on, uh, my friend, you are spot on. So we just we just want to keep getting you to be more spot on and more things because the things that you were uh, spot on on, you were spot on. And, and when you're right, your logic is perfect. I mean, the way you, that's why we are, you know, in these explications, we got to have you talk out loud so I can hear what your brain is doing. And boy, when it's, uh, when it's, when it's working like that, I'm going, oh man, that's impressive. And then also with the private placement, the Reg D, um, you have 506C and 506B, and then 506C, you can do the advertising, and then yep. for B, it's up to 35. Then, now, 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 you're just, now you're just showing off. I'm well, teasing. I'm just trying I'm to teasing. Uh, you went there first, so you're correct. So how many investors can you have in a 506B? You uh, can have an unlimited number of investors in a 506B, but no more than? 35. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Very testable. On Monday, June 15th, an investor purchased for regular way settlement 20,000 face value of 8% municipal bonds that mature on November 1st of 2035. How many days of accrued interest is the investor required to pay? Regular way settlement that mature. Okay, um, purchases a regular way settlement for accrued interest. Um, so I'm just trying to think of like the dated date when they started to accrue. Yeah, so that you're, you're exactly right. So a settlement, right, is Monday, June 15th. So Tuesday, the 16th, right? Wednesday, the 17th is when those bonds are going to start occurring interest. Settle. Well, no, it's from the last so, time it paid interest up to, but not including 
the settlement date. So I'm going to go 46 days. Yeah. Again, I was going to actually do it. But, uh, let me just clear up that. That's fine. Let's, let's just see. Boom. Uh, how did you figure? So now my question is, how did you figure the last time the bonds paid uh, interest? You're correct, by the way. So it, it there was, was November, right? So that yeah. means M and N. Good job. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. I was about to set up uh, and start counting the days. So you were ahead of me, basically, right? I was getting ready to say, we're going to count it, and you boom, and you were already done. So good. So, yeah, it's up to, but not including. Okay. Uh, if an individual expects the market price of XYZ to increase, what supports her market sentiment? So, boom, what would support her market sentiment? You want the market price to increase. Yeah, so that means you're bullish. So you want to buy calls and write right. puts. Oh, man, you are so good, geez. Bam. I mean, you should feel pretty good about yourself in terms of those uh, the ones you get like that. The <laughs> city of Fremont, Nebraska, is issuing revenue bonds to increase its electric, electric power generating facilities and to replace uh, outstanding bonds. Mm -hmm. Interest on the bonds is. Okay, so we have to know that this is a municipal bond. It indeed is. And it's they're issuing bonds to replace their outstanding bonds. And I know that they're automatically exempt from federal. But do I know if they're living in there? Like, do I know if they're triple tax? No. Okay, yeah. Well, okay. What do we say? Trust your, you can trust your gut, right? Yeah. It's hoping you overthink it. You know, uh, if you're listening to STC, don't take this personally. I mean, this is a compliment. But here, STC is being bigger jerks than the real test. What I mean by that is they're trying to do that Jedi mind trick on you and cloud your mind. Like, yeah. oh, you know, maybe there's something about power generated facilities, right? So. <laughs> Uh, which the long statement is not true. The bond council is very testable, and so is the legal opinion. Uh, unqualified opinion. Um, it means that they're in um, adverse situations. You want an unqualified opinion because then that means there's none. If it's um, qualified, well, then there that's is. That's exactly right, and this is very testable. So the bond council... Uh, does it? You should definitely know it. The legal opinion test to the legislative authority, the federally tax exempt and no prospectus and unqualified is bad because that means with reservation, or excuse me, unqualified is good without reservation. Qualified is bad. Absolutely. A variable annuity would be most suitable for which of the following customers? <clears throat> okay. So a client in a high who is purchasing the annuity for spouse retirement needs. Okay, no. I don't think that would be it because then they would be, I would assume they'd be more descriptive because you can have a joint and last survivor yeah, annuity. That's right. Spouse. Um, a client in a high tax bracket who is purchasing the annuity for short-term liquidity needs. Um, I don't think it's that either. I think annuities are like more of a long-term and I would invest in an annuity after mm. i've maxed out my retirement accounts yeah, absolutely um i'm liking c would be most suitable which of the following um between c and d yeah I, to be honest with you i don't like any of these <laughs> you know, but you know we gotta take one so think about purchasing the annuity in the yeah, form most suitable so i i don't think any of the i'm here where i'm struggling i think uh a is out because there's nothing that has to do with tax bracket. B is out. Now we have C or D, and I, I don't like either of those, but I, you know, I got to pick one basically. But C, like the reason I'm a little confused on C is because 401k is a qualified. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Retirement plan. And why yeah. would you put a tax deferred product? That's in exactly right. I'm with you. I'm with you. So I'm going to go D, but yeah, like. I'm with you. I think this is a poor. I don't like this question. What the heck? Uh, yeah, let's see what they tell us on this one. And we didn't like this one at all. A variable annuity is most suitable for investors seeking long-term tax-deferred growth for retirement. Okay, got I agree. A tax-deferred investment, as with a variable annuity, becomes more advantageous for an investor in a high-tax 
bracket. Uh, I'm not sure. I, this is one I think is kind of funky. If your really is unsuitable for customer, we, we agreed short term is out. And we agreed we wouldn't put in the 401k. And we know it's 59 and a half. We just went, I think, the opposite way on process of elimination. I don't really, I told you, I didn't think any of these were suitable myself. I don't even think A is the thing because it's not about a high tax bracket. I get what STC may be saying here. And uh, his spouse's retirement needs. I mean, yeah, your point, I could make a joint and last survivor, you know, but with last I survivor. just didn't think that I would like yeah. buy a variable annuity for my spouse. I was. You no, know, I'm with you. I'm with you. That was a poor one. So I think that's the first yeah. one. I think that uh, I uh, think it was poor question. Uh, which of long securities is not considered a debt obligation of a municipal government? I kind of like this one. Um, what's a direct obligation of the municipal government? Um, revenue bonds, geo bonds. I know that closed end funds could contain. Yeah, it's, that's right. So, but is a closed end bond fund a debt obligation of a municipal government? No. Right. Yeah, they're not. They can yeah. carry them, but they're yeah. Not. They can own them, but they, you know they're not. It's that not. is a bond fund. I mean, yeah, you you call up your city and you call the closed say say hey, what about your closed end fund? They go, what are you talking about? All the following information should be contained by a reg obtained by a registered rep when opening a new account, except education. Yeah, this comes up. I don't know why it comes up all the time. You know, SDC has it, Kaplan has it. Everybody has this question. I'm not sure if it's based on debrief, but it is not part. I It may be just a good distractor that people like on the accept, but you definitely need a street address, physical address. You definitely need the tax ID number and you definitely need the occupation. So it's not so much that you don't need the education. It's more like, what do you need? And then if they were to ask, like, if you were a non-US resident and you, yeah. you need a passport number, right? Right, right. Or some verification, some kind of a tax uh, verification. Uh, okay. Usually it would be a W-9 or something like that. Which of the following is not considered an aggressive investment? High yield is aggressive. BDC is aggressive. Sector fund also aggressive. I'm going to go index fund. I like that. I like this question. Uh, index funds are passive, right? So good job. If an investment has a beta of 0.8 and the market rises by 5%, which of the following is the expected uh, expected of uh, that investment? Okay, so I know that when the beta is less than one, it's not as volatile, so it's under performing the market that's correct you're absolutely yeah. correct so now it's uh you know a or uh, a or c just based on you being correct that it's going to underperform so it'll fall by four by the way i love that too because that means you don't have to do the math right? yeah, so, i was gonna I was, you know i already did the math that yeah. you ahead of me sydney i did the math and i came up with the four percent mm -hmm. and then you just said it's going to underperform i go well damn I could have done that, right? I only have to do the math. So, yeah. so now you got to tell me it's going to underperform, but it's going to go up or it's going to underperform. It's going to go down. Well, if, one, if it went up by 4%, then it would be over outperforming, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's going to fall because that's underperforming. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Right? It's still going up. It's just oh, yeah, it's rising, but it's underperforming. It's A. Sorry. Yeah. But, I don't know. So the same thing going head. down. Same thing going down, right? It would go down. It'll outperform in a down market, outperform because it won't go down as much. Right. Uh, supplying credit reserves for savings and loans and other mortgages by loaning them money against their collateral is the purpose of which government sponsored agency? Sally May. C. Uh, Sal Sally May is for student loans. Wait. Mortgage lenders. Is it Fannie? Well, you tell me. Freddie Mac. 
I'm going to go D maybe. Uh, hold on. Oh, I don't that's think that's a test question, but it's the Federal Reserve Home Loan Bank. Okay. The FFCB okay. is nothing. And then Sally Mae is student loans. I don't even think Sally Mae is around anymore, but it's uh, that one, right? So I don't think it's a bad miss. The thing that is testable about Freddie Mac uh, and uh, Fannie Mae is that they don't have that, right? The student loans, I'm just looking at the here. Uh, what is the current yield of a 10-year bond with a 5% coupon trading at 98, haulable in two years? I got 5.10%. Yeah, what it pays you divided by what it costs you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. An investor has recently converted five convertible bonds and received 200 shares of the common stock. What are the tax consequences? You've recently converted five convertible bonds and received 200 shares of the company's common stock for each bond. The conversion is not immediately taxable and the cost basis of the bond will be used to find the cost basis of the shares. They will have to pay. I don't think the conversion is immediately taxed. You are correct, right? You owe taxes when you get out of the position. So excellent. Excellent. <laughs> uh, which of the long statements is true in relationship to the buyer of a call option? You buy a call, you have, I think it's like limited risk. Yeah, whenever you buy an option contract, that's a good thing. The most you can lose is your premium, right? Right. Yeah, you're limiting your risk. because Right, you right. And you're, are you bullish or bearish when you buy a call? You're bullish and you have unlimited profit potential. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. If a registered rep has discretion over an account, he may... Just discretion, um, he can, I think it's discretion is you can buy but not sell without approval um, or trade for the client without prior approval. Deposit funds, withdraw funds from the account. Um, you can't withdraw because you'd need like a full POA. That's right. Um, and when you're using discretion, I'm automatically like asset action amount. Right on. Um, so trade for the client without prior approval, uh, of each trade buy, not sell securities without prior approval. I'm between C and D. I'm not going to lie. Um, okay, so what do you want? I'm trying to talk myself through this real quick. I mean, you said you should be able based on talking out loud, which I like you to do as your tutor, you should have got the answer because you just actually with what you said, excluded one of these. Oh, I did. Because you can't buy securities. I'm going to go trade for the client. Yeah, that's right. Remember, you can sell. The action, you get to decide action, whether to buy or sell, mm -hmm. which security to buy or sell. So you mean you gave me the right answer when you said action, asset amount. So you just got to then apply action, asset amount to the actual question. I just, uh, sometimes on the easier ones. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's Which of the following risk is considered systematic risk? Market, because business regulatory and liquidity. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, like I said, when you're solid, you're solid. Uh, order is placed to buy 500 shares of XYZ at 26. What type of order is this? A market order. Oh, that was. Oh, wait, bad. hold on. Hold on. That is a bad miss. Hold on. I think it's a stop limit. That's a bad miss. Or a limit order? Okay. Okay. Hold There's on. There's nothing in there about a stop. You're just saying, Dean, I want to buy it at 26. It's my job to know that that is a limit order. Uh, yeah. Okay. And there's an implied or better. And are, where are we going to place this uh, buy limit? Are we going to place it above or uh, below? Where is XYZ uh, trading at right now? Is it more than 26 or less than 26? Um, it's less. 
it's, or, uh, it's more because you want to buy it. Yes. Buy limits are below the buy mark. Limits are below. I just rewrote my. There you go. Yeah. Make sure you got that. You know what? Like I said, you know, we are giving you kudos on your options. And listen, if you are capable of getting advanced options, you are capable of everything else found on the Series 7. And you want to make sure you're getting all those aim and shoot point and click. So two takeaways from this question. Unless it says stop, it's not a stop. Second, customer gives me a price. It's my job to know that that customer has a limit. They have a limit on what they're willing, in this case, to pay. And then if they, I call them and say, you got it at 25, they're going to say, that's wonderful. And then your slobs over bliss is worth points. Limit order. Okay. Yeah. All the following are reasons for restricting activity in an account, except. The account is in dispute a client wants to receive a security and certificate form okay all of the following are reasons yeah they're kind of a funky question i'm not quite sure what they're getting at here i think we could still try and get this right by process of elimination yeah so a client wants to receive a security and certificate form i don't think yeah, yeah I, I don't think that's anything that looks like a problem right right these other All ones are kind of funky, but I'm like, you know, I don't tell clients their accounts are restricted because they want that certificate. I mean, you know, uh, I would probably, the way I would have answered this is what I call reduction to the ridiculous. What does the world look like if customers tell me they want their stuff and I say, sorry, it's restricted. No, I gotta, I gotta give you your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. A client contacts a registered representative after reviewing financial statements of the S-Works Carbon Company, the client is confused since the company paid a cash dividend, but had a loss for the last fiscal year. Uh, which of the following statements is true? If you have a loss, it may be... It may pay cash dividend only with approval. If the company has a loss in its last fiscal year, only with prior approval, the customer, I think it's the customer is permitted to pay the cash dividend, even if it has a loss. Yeah, that's up to the board to decide whether we can continue to pay the dividend. Right? A lot of companies say, we're going to suck it up and we're going to continue to pay it because our shareholders are relying on it. Uh, I don't know why STC has this particular question, but remember, you don't have a right to a dividend. You only have a right to a dividend if declared, and you should definitely know shareholders don't approve dividends in any circumstances, the board. And you should know the SEC never approves anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of a weird one. Uh, a member firm has decided to send all client account statements on a quarterly basis. Uh, this practice would... This is a good question because... I know that you send monthly statements with penny stocks, and I know That's that right. normally you would send account statements quarterly, but if there's activity in the account, from what I've read on STC, like they say that it should be monthly. Um, so I guess be permitted if there's no activity in the account or just be permitted. I'm like- Yeah, I, I think you're gonna miss this one. It's permitted. Yeah. I mean, we now do it quarterly. I don't know if people have dated materials, but it's actually- a quarterly i don't have to send it monthly even if there is activity i only have to send it monthly if there's a penny stock and i think the reason for that change is relatively recent but mm -hmm. the reason for that change is because i think now people know that you that they have computers and you know Sydney, do i really need this send your statement can't you open up your you know your computer and log on and see what's going on so that's just like a pretty unfair question yeah, to me well I, I kind of agree but i get that a lot from people who and i don't know if it's because they're using data materials or not but it's not it used to be quarterly monthly of activity and penny stock and now it's just quarterly and penny stock that's it what is the significance of a municipal bond rating uh it's the credit rating yeah it's a credit rating right mm -hmm. on the issuer you know, the stuff you're solid, as we said, is boom, you're solid on. Under FINRA rules, an email is considered correspondence in all the following situations, except, I like this one. 
Um, uh, the email was sent to every customer within a 30 day period. Cause I don't know how many customers that is. Cause the email was sent to 25 or fewer pro uh -huh. prospects or, um, existing. That's Excellent. still, Excellent. Awesome. I mean, I'm telling you how to stuff your salt on, you know, maybe you don't want to go and help in production. Maybe you want to go into compliance. Yeah. It seems like, you know, those rules, right? That was a good one. Uh, and then remember the correspondence would be 25 or fewer. And then remember pre-distribution or retail communication, pre or post distribution approval by a principal if it's correspondence. So excellent. Uh, FINRA's website address must be provided to each customer. Uh, I have no idea about this one. <laughs> I've never heard of a question about providing FINRA's website address, but. Um, initially upon opening. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea. Let's see. Unless right. it's annually. Yeah, yeah I, I have no idea. So now we know. <laughs> so uh, again, I'll defer to SDC. Maybe they've had some debrief on that. The thing that I would be about worried about on website is not this uh, website would be uh, on the broker dealer side. There has to be a link to broker check. That's very testable. And there has to be a link that tells you either gives you the business continuity plan or tells you how to get it. So uh, yeah, I had no idea. So stump the tutor. I have no idea. Um, a corporation successfully sold its IPO last year and now needs to sell additional stock. Sounds like a follow-on. Uh, the firm has a non-dilutive feature in its articles of corporation needs to provide preemptive rights to its existing stockholders. This uh, means that they receive rights to purchase additional shares at a discount to the current market price. The right on, right on. Boom. Which of the following statements is characteristics of a closed in investment company? Uh, D. Boom. Uh, if securities are received as a gift, how is the cost base determined? If it's received as a gift. Yeah, you got this one earlier, right? So, you know, yeah, we had, remember gift. you had Bob? Yeah, you're inheriting the same cost basis. It, well, you're not inheriting here. It says it's a gift. Yeah, it's the cost basis of the donor, right? Oh, it's the lesser? Lesser, we received a gift. How's it? The lesser of um, cost basis of securities received a gift is lesser. Uh, I'm not sure if they mean this, if, if it's a charitable deduction. Uh, that's a miss I would have got as well. It's the cost basis of the donor. So here's where you got the lesser of the cost basis is lesser market value of the donor's cost basis. Oh, I see what they're saying. So we, 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 we I think this is a gotcha question. Okay. But what they're saying here, and I get, I get it. I, I too would have missed this is that if I give it to you and my cost base was 50, but the now stock is trading at 30, then it's going to be 30. But you know, oh. I don't think you see that on the test. That I is true. Is between the inheriting the gift, yeah, right? yeah. So the well, and inherited is no doubt. There's no, it's going to be a step up, right? Yeah. So uh, that's a miss on you and a miss on me both. I mean, <clears throat> boom. Uh, broker dealer is not required to respond to complaints that are delivered orally. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of still kind of stupid, but true. I, I don't like that it's orally. I do like that what they're getting at is written complaints or written complaints. There's no distinction about how you got it through text or. Which of all uh, transactions uh, qualifies a customer as a pattern day trader? Four day or four day trades in a five. Yeah, four. And then remember, what is your minimum equity requirement if you were a pattern day trader? 25,000. Excellent. Uh, which of all choices is a valid reason for a caring broker to protest an account transfer request? Um, wouldn't it be an account title mismatch? Yeah, that seems like the best answer given the answer set, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how many business days do you have as the old, old broker to verify the positions uh, before transferring to a new broker? Um, you have, I think, one day. Right on. And how many days to get the transfer done? Three days. Excellent. Excellent. And you can see that in the rationale down there, right? 
That's yeah. very testable. One business day to verify, three days to transfer, very testable. Mm -hmm. A convertible bond is issued with a conversion price of 10. Assuming par value is 1,000, what is parity price of the bond with the stock currently trading at 20? I got 2,000. Well, I'm uh, just doing now, right? We got our conversion price. We got to get our conversion ratio. Our conversion ratio is 100. And then we're going to times it by the current market price, and uh, you uh, beat the tutor. You say two thousand. Yeah, that's what and I. That's want. embarrassing that you're ahead of your tutor. Uh, you know, it took me a couple seconds to get out my calculator, and <laughs> uh, you are going to have to calculate parity. I know of no draw on Series Seven in which you're going to have to not have to calculate parity. Uh, uh, what type of voting method is more advantageous to minority shareholders? I like this one. Cumulative. Right on. I would know the difference. What about super voting? What can you tell me about super voting shares? Are you talking about just like larger shares? The statutory? No, super voting shares, very testable on seven, are shares that have more than one vote per share. Oh, okay. With super voting shares, right? Yeah. If a corporation is liquidated, what security, which security is given priority? Secured bondholders. Yeah, like I say, uh, Sydney, the stuff you are selling on, you are so solid. You too remind me of Nico. I do. <laughs> and here's why. Nico, man, his improvement and the dedication, the discipline, and the organization that he put in to improve his likelihood of passing uh, was, you know, just marked. I mean, you could just tell. And the same for you. You can tell you're dedicated, you're disciplined, you're organized. On the stuff that you're you're getting correct, you're you're solid, and we just got to keep just adding to that and just getting you so more solid on more stuff. And I think you're going to make your market too, make Thank your mark. You. Uh, customer buys two. I probably jinxed you now. Uh, customer buys two ABC June ten calls at two. What is uh, what in it, when is settlement and how much is due? One business day and four hundred dollars. Oh, I'm so glad you got that right. It would have been embarrassing, right? If I chatting you up and then all of a sudden you miss a basic option question that would be <laughs> t plus one for options guys right on uh what's your maximum loss uh, in this transaction uh you buy a call so your premier that's your yeah 400 dollars yeah what's your break even in this transaction um is it 14 no, break even is per share. 12. 12, right? Why What's wouldn't we add in? the strike price plus premium? If the cool. stock's at 12 and you can buy it at 10 and you exercise, you make two, you pay two, you break even. Okay. Well, I knew that, but I the just... gain potential. Right? If a client has chosen arbitration as a remedy for dispute, he Arbitration may appeal any decision through arbitration. Can you appeal them? They're binding. So no, we learned that. That's right. Must resolve the matter through the court system. Has not waived his right to pursue the matter in court. Um, This is a good question because I don't think that arbitration is like the court system. They're, yeah, they're separate processes for sure. They're separate. So he waived his right to pursue the matter in court. Yeah, that's the whole point. Is we don't want to go into court with you, right? I mean, that's why we make you sign the arbitration clause, right? Right. Uh, clearing a trade means, that's kind of a funky one. Clearing a trade that the buyer and seller have agreed on the terms of a trade, that the seller has delivered the security, that the buyer has paid for the security. I'm going to go see just because I'm not really sure what they're asking. Yeah, I think I, I kind of, it's kind of a funky question. You're correct. It's the process of clearing, clear ing. So the ing is what makes it see. 
the, the trade is cleared when A and B have been met. Um, here, I would know the process of clearing the trade. What I mean by that is it goes to the order department first who transmits the order to the appropriate market center. Then it goes to the purchase and sales department who generates the confirmations and uh, matches trades. Then it goes to the margin department who determines whether monies or securities are due. Then it goes to the cashiering department. Uh, I would know that sequence of clearing a trade. And uh, that sequence, a good memory aid for that is, do you know the memory aid device for order department, purchase and sales department, margin department, cashiering department? Do you know that memory aid? No. Here you go. Yeah, I got two. Oh, you know, is it, two. It's not pro golfers don't miss. Is no, it? no, no, that was pre-sale group designated member. Okay. This one is order peanuts, Mr. Carter. I've never Order heard peanuts, Mr. Carter. Or if you don't like that one, you can use other people's monies count. Okay, I've heard that one. Yeah, you like that one better? Either one. No, uh, I know. On a regular way basis, a municipal bond is purchased by a client on Monday, March 14th. The client must make payment on Wednesday, March 16th. Yeah, T plus two. Cool. Uh, which of the following statements is true concerning warrants? Warrants cannot be treated as a separate security. Um, warrants give instructors the right to buy shares of an issuing company at a preset price. That is uh, rights. Boom. I like that. Listen, as your tutor, love that. You didn't get wobbly. You saw your answer. You liked your answer. You aim and shoot, point and click, move on to the next performance opportunity. Excellent. Uh, a client would like to open a numbered account and RR may open the account. Uh, a, provided the broker dealer is written. Yeah, I got to have a letter on file attesting to ownership. The only person needs to know who it is is the branch manager, registered rep, and operationally, it works just like any other account. Yep. Assets uh, like depreciation. Man, I'll tell you, when you are rocking and rolling, you are rocking and rolling. <laughs> well, actually, like the balance sheet questions are like one of my weak points, but I just know that assets minus, li minus liabilities is yeah, net worth. Love know it. That net worth is on the balance sheet, and then the gross revenues are on the income statement. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, what information would not need be disclosed by a broker dealer and a research report? An analyst has owned shares. Uh, is it they've owned the shares um, one year before writing the report? Because if it's over one year, I don't think you yeah, have to. Right on. Good job. Good job. I don't think you'll see that, but I will. I think, again, on these ones that are not need or accept. It's mainly that A, B, and C are definitely, right? So sometimes people lock on too much on the wrong answers. So, you know, D is a wrong answer. And what you want to take away from these questions is what is correct about this information, A, B, and C. Yeah, and you say that a lot on your channel. Like what's- Yeah, because yeah, what those accept, you know, and I well, we, I don't think we can make poor man's flashcards out of an SDC exam like we do if it's PDFs kind of stuff. Which of the margin accounts would generally provide the greatest amount of leverage? I kind of like this. So you told me a pattern day trader is 25 grand and you told me uh, you uh, identified it correctly. And now we're asking you which of these are going to have uh, the greatest amount of leverage. Or, I mean, the greatest amount of leverage. So... I don't think it's the combined margin account. Yeah, that's just a normal account. There's, you know, it's just a normal uh, account. Portfolio based margin. There's no such thing as strategy based margin. Yeah, I'm between B or C. I feel like the pattern day margin. Yeah, they get four times the amount. Above. Yeah, so that's why it, that's that's the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Because they get four times whatever above their maintenance they are. So, oh, I missed it. Uh, yeah. portfolio based margin well portfolio I, yeah i can see why i missed this because portfolio based is about you don't have to meet your maintenance goals promptly 
So let's see why Dean missed this. I missed it because I was thinking the pattern day trader gets four times their their amount there over uh, maintenance. Uh, it's risk based based on the net risk, less and leverage is greater. Yeah, I get I get why why I missed that, but I would think if I got tested on portfolio margin, it would be that my maintenance calls that it's it's a dynamic scoring on the margin. In other words, I I get credit for positions that move opposite ways, and I don't have to meet maintenance calls promptly. Oh well, tutor missed one. What did you say? Did you say did you get it right and I got it wrong, or did I talk? I, was, I was between portfolio and pattern, yeah, but I was very. We'll say we'll say the dean missed that one. Uh, which of the following statements best describes the tax treatment of 529 uh, withdrawals? The withdrawals are, okay, so tax treatment of 529s. I'm pretty sure if you take it for a qualified withdrawal, it's tax-free. And that is the whole point. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how can an issuer retire debt early if its bonds are not callable? Um, well, advanced refunding just means that it's going to have like a lower rate or something the tax swap. Uh, I'm kind of liking the tender offer option. Yeah. What do we tell you about ones you like? To stick with them. Yeah. I can say, please give me back my bond. <laughs> it was callable. I don't have to ask you politely and that offer it of tender. I have, I can just call it. So mm -hmm. if it's not callable, then I say, hey, hey, please, will you give it back for 105? Will you give it back for 110? If I do make a tender offer in this or any other circumstance, how often, how long do I have to leave a tender offer open? 20 days. Right on, good job. Uh, private sector securities uh, that are backed by a pool of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and other mortgage securities are referred to as kind of funky how they're asking this, but no, I kind of like what they're getting at. Is that the CMOs? Yeah, yeah. because remember, we're the ones who are slicing them and dicing them. Yeah, I mean, the G Jenny Mays are included in that. Yeah, yeah. So kind of a funky way, but I, I like what they're getting at, that this is what we're carving up and we can carve them up. That's not a treasury security. It's a, you know, treasury uh, or excuse me, a government agency security pass through that's been carved up into cascading cash flows. And we have, remember in the CMOs, we have PACs and we have TACs, the different tranches. Mm -hmm. uh, what has more predictability and less risk, a plan amortization class, tranche, yeah. tranche, or targeted amortization class? The PAC. Right on, right on. All the following choices are disadvantages of a limited partner, except... Lack of voting power. They, they can vote. To remove like the general partner. That's so that's right. All the volumes are disadvantages. Lack of liquidity. I mean, con the condo. We're looking for something that is an advantage. Something that is an advantage? Well, it says all the following are disadvantages except. So, so they're asking me for which one is not a disadvantage, something that's a good thing. Well, the conduit, the flow through of income and loss, right? Because that's what yeah, all. Right on, right on. So, boy, the grammar, you just got to be careful on some of these grammar questions. You, can't, you know, whether it's SDC or Kaplan or Past Perfect or, you know, not Menomin uses the Kaplan Q Bank. You just got to be careful because, you know, they love to give you that double negative, right? So, disadvantages except, right? So, which uh, flips the question. Uh, I tell you, I, I, I really uh, admire uh, people who English is a second language taking this test. I had a Young lady, and uh, I chat her up all the time. Her primary language is Mandarin. I think, oh my God, I can't even imagine. And she would be so frustrated because she you know, wouldn't translate even in her Google Translator. I had somebody the other day, and I was teasing them. I, they said, uh, you know, their the primary language is Espanol. I said, man, if I could tutor in Espanol, I could charge 500 bucks an hour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Which of the following systems is used to report information on the origination, transmittal, and execution? of an equity security. Well, the, the trace is for corporate bonds. Love it, it's for debt. I love it, process elimination. The trade reporting facility, the order audit trail system, the national securities clearing system. Um, I like OATS, how it's sounding. 
but I'm kind of leaning towards uh, A or D. So A. Wow. Oh. Uh, I chose A, and here's why. Oats is no longer with us. So Oats is, I don't know what the uh, date on this, I'll send this to our friends at SDC, but Oats has been uh, replaced with a different system to do this. So that misses on me. But the order uh, order audit tracking system is, this trail system is designed for limit order protection. Uh, TRF is a reporting system for equity securities. Uh, well, I think that the audit is it enables FINRA to review equity. Lay of the order of modification council that is a reporting facility for equity securities. I'm not sure why I missed that one. That one's on me. Uh, customer wants to open a cash account. What information is not required? What information is not required? The customer signature. Uh, which of the description characterizes inverse exchange traded funds? This is very testable. Uh, C. Boom. And you might on a bad draw even have to do some math on that one. Yeah. Uh, all the following retail communications must clearly state the member firm that created it, except... Is it the company sales literature? Yeah, this one, I don't, uh, I think this is more of a 24 test question than it is a seven test question. The only uh, recruitment or the only retail communication we're allowed to run blind, blind means without disclosing the member firm. Uh, before I tell you, Katie, that, what's your answer here? Is it the recruitment advertisement? Yeah, that's the only one where we uh, can run that blind. Okay. And uh, the other rule about that is I can't make exaggerated claims of income opportunities in the securities industry. A 40-year-old client with high income, high net worth. Wow. Wants to rebalance her portfolio. She's conservative, seeking both income and safety of principle. Which of the uh, following is appropriate allocation of her assets? Um, She's 40. So 100 minus the age. So 60 should relatively be in like equities. Mm -hmm. She has a conservative and she's seeking safety of principle. Um, I really like the 50% investment grade um, municipal bonds and the yeah, 50. Yeah, yeah, I wish they would give us more about her income, but yeah, that sounds like the right answer, right? Yes. I like that. Was there, is that was your answer, right? I picked it yeah. because you said it. Yeah, Once you like, said it, I'm trying as your tutor to kind of, you know, make you go with your gut by clicking the button before you start going somewhere else. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Aim and shoot, point and click. I love that. I, I call that a cocktail party trick, but at least that 100 minus her age gets you to close to the two to choose from, right? You can toss out one based on that little trick about 100 minus their age. Uh, which of the following statements are true regarding a REIT purchased through a private placement? Is that kind of telling me that it's going to be like a non-listed REIT? That's exactly what that's saying. Okay, so they're non-traded. Boom. And that means you can't buy a non-traded REIT unless you're what kind of a person? Uh, accredited investor. Right on. right on. If a client is in the process of opening a margin account, which form is not mandatory? This is a good one. This is testable. Loan consent. Boom, I told you, I'm so pleased with uh, the stuff you know. The stuff you know, bam. A uh, 10-year uh, bond has a current Parker price of 95, a conversion price of 30, and the common stock is currently trading at 25. What is parity price of the bond? Uh, 8.83. Eight, Eight three three point two five. Uh, Manny, you, you you must be pretty damn good at math. I'm still struggling to do the math. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, beat the tutor. If we ever play beat the tutor, you're you're gonna win because I'm I'm doing I'm taking the thousand uh, and poof. You know, and you haven't seen these questions before. Never. I just know that with parity, you're gonna get the conversion price and then multiply that yeah, answer. Yeah, that's that. exactly right. You know, I'm embarrassed that, you know, I don't know why you, it's very possible. There's lots of people that are better at math, math than me. And you're certainly one of them. You're, you're always beating me to the math. 
Uh, periodic payment variable annuities provide which of the following? Periodic payment. Um, the payment is, I think the payment is fixed at the time of annuitization because you're periodically paying um, or it'll fluctuate. Um, I'm between C and D. I'm on, I don't think it's, or maybe it's an unchanging number of accumulation units. Um, periodic payment variable annuities. Periodic payment. I'm going to go, I really don't know between C and D. Like I'm. Yeah, I'm with you. This one's a tough one. Periodic. I think, I think, you, I think you can get it right. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking, but I think you can uh, think this through. So you're either telling me, let's just be clear what C is saying. You're telling me that once you annuitize, that payment isn't going to change. D is saying that when you annuitize, the payment will go up or down. I mean, the payment can go up and down depending on the separate account, right? On the air. Yeah. On the assumed interest rate, right? Mm -hmm. So the number of annuities is fixed. We turn your accumulation units into annuity units, mm -hmm. and those annuity units are fixed. And then the payment goes up or down based on the assumed interest rate. Yep. Yeah, good job. That was a tough one. The filing of which document? The filing of which document creates a partnership? Is that uh, creates it? Yeah, kind of interesting the way they say that. So that's distinguishing between, you know, how we're going to run the thing is different than how we create the thing. I feel like it might be the certificate of limited partnership. Yeah, kind of a funky question. I don't really think that's testable. The agreement is how we're going to run the partnership. So, and, you know, by the way, I think this STC practice exam, I would say this has been kind of fair so far that they haven't overdosed us on margin or on partnerships, whereas a lot of vendors really go overkill on partnerships and margin questions you're never going to see. Uh, so I think they've been pretty legitimate in terms of that. Each of the following risk are considered unsystematic except interest rate you are so good on that <laughs> if we could just give you 123 125 option questions and 125 uh, systematic risk questions woo -hoo! <laughs> you'd be in the make your mark all margin accounts are required to have their values calculated at the close of trading each business day this procedure is referred to as Marking to the mark. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not. It's forward pricing, not forward debiting. Yeah, and we got to do it once per business day. Once per business day. Marking to the market. Yeah, we also do uh, you know mark to marking. Uh, forward debiting is not margin accounts. That's forward pricing for mutual funds. But yeah, mark to market, and then based on the mark to market, we find out whether you have excess equity, SMA, all that kind of stuff. Uh, do you know the classical margin equation along? LMV minus DR. Right on. That's how we're going to do it, the mark, right? And then when you know the classical margin equation short? Is it CR minus SMV? Oh, yeah, absolutely. A bond that was issued with a 6% coupon has been quoted on a 5.92 basis. Which of the following statements is true premium. of the bond? Trading at a premium. Yeah, the stuff that you are good at, you are really good at. And again, you didn't even bring up the teeter-totter. You just, boom, you just kind of nailed it. How are treasury bills uh, quoted? On a discount yield basis. Boom, yeah. Your aim and shoot stuff, uh, you're pretty damn good on. You know, when you're rocking and rolling, you're rocking and rolling. Par divided by conversion price. Uh, boom, I like that one because it's an intermediate step. And if you can't can't do that, then you can't do parity calculations. And again, we knew you were going to get that right because you're quicker than me on that. Uh, uh, in order to be eligible to receive an impending dividend on a stock, an individual must purchase the stock in a regulatory transaction no later than. Is it the X dividend date? Or well, the, the be, yeah, be careful. It says to get the dividend. 
Yeah. So the, to get the dividend, you're gonna have to buy it the day before the X. Yeah. So the record. Yeah, or that one was kind of tricky, right? Two days before the data record. Yeah. Okay. Derp. So I be remember. careful on that. Now, again, it would also be a violation for me to call you two business days, day before the X day. Hey, Sydney, you buy today, you get the dividend, you wait till tomorrow, you don't get the dividend. That would be a big no-no, right? Selling dividends. A uh, investment has a beta 1.4, and when the market rises by five, what is the expected return of that investment? It'll rise by seven, or, okay. Hold on. It'll, uh, yeah, it'll rise by seven and outperform the market. Yeah, boom. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure it's right on the ending part. Yeah, you know, you're, for the most part, you've been, you know, I would certainly trust yourself on, particularly on math questions. You're pretty damn quick on the arithmetic. So, you know, uh, which security can be repurchased by the issuer at a predetermined price? I like this one. Preemptive rate. Uh, preemptive rights can be repurchased by the issuer. That is incorrect, right? And the reason that's incorrect is in a preemptive right, it's not the issuer that's purchasing it. Repurchase means the issuer is going to buy it back from somebody, right? And that would be your call feature. So it's the callable preferred yeah. stock. Yeah, right. Right? because they can call it away. I kind of like that question. I deserve to get that wrong. Well, yeah, and the, and the point here is, repurchased by the issuer the issuer is purchasing it mm -hmm. that's so right we really sold it so yeah that was uh that was a miss uh, a sharing arrangement that has limited partners pay all of the program's expenses and recoup their uh investment before the jump arm receives any money is this is a good question yeah, I don't think you'll see it. I, I told you there's a lot of legacy questions. They used to test quite a bit on partnerships in the old days, and they don't anymore. Um, a sharing arrangement as limited partners pay all of the program's expenses. So the pro they have to pay all the program's expenses and could recoup their investment before the general partner receives any money. Um, is that like disproportionate sharing? Disproportionate sharing is where I put up a little bit of money and get a lot. So yeah, it's, no it's, it's the reversionary working. I don't think you'll see this at all. Overriding role is a percentage of the gross and functional is where we split up the tax benefits. Uh, I don't think uh, I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen any of this on the seven in, in a long, long time. I will say uh, I call these legacy questions that all test prep vendors have, Pass Perfect, Kaplan, uh, and uh, STC. Uh, and what I will say is that so far, I've only seen a couple of these kind of uh, what I call legacy questions. So, you know, uh, which is good because there's, uh, you know, there's some vendors that have all kinds of questions that uh, no longer have or haven't been tested in years. All the following conditions allow funds to be withdrawn from a 529 without a 10% penalty, except. So one of these is going to be uh, going to be a taxable problem. Receives a scholarship payment or allowance because it's if they become disabled, if they die, and if they use it for medical. How is that? All the following conditions allow funds to be withdrawn without a 10% penalty, except. So the beneficiary will use the funds for medical expenses. So yeah, it's not medical expenses. This was not a bad, hard question. The beneficiary receives payment or allowance, and that would be uh, taxable to get a scholarship or not. I don't think it's clear from the grammar how we're supposed to get to that. It's actually D, right? The beneficiary will use the funds for medical expenses. So I don't know if he's going to use a medical expenses. I'm giving him the money and who knows what he's doing. But isn't uh, I that don't like the question. qualified expense? Uh, well, we don't know the beneficiary is the one who's controlling it. I think that's why it's the problematic. Withdrawals of the 529 are generally allowed without penalty. In addition, 10% of it's due to the beneficiary's death, disability, or receipt of a scholarship payment. Although withdrawals from the 529 are permitted for medical expenses, they're subject to the taxes and 10% penalty. I think that's a poor question, but you know, oh well. 
Uh, which of the following statements are true regarding term issue municipal bonds? Term, uh, they mature on the same date. Boom, the things you're solid on. Uh, what would C have been the right, uh, what would uh, D have been the right answer for? Serial bond. Right on, right on. Uh, which of the following statements is true regarding a, bo a bond tax swap compared with a Wassell rule? Ooh, that's pretty high end. A wash sale permits an investor to deduct a capital loss on the sale of a bond. Um, both wash sales and bond tax swaps have tax benefits. Um, no, that's not true. In a bond tax swap, the bond being purchased must have material differences from the bond being sold for a loss. I, I'm leaning towards like B. It doesn't permit to deduct a capital loss on the sale of a bond, but I'm also torn between that and D. Yeah, you're correct. It's either B or D. So maybe D. Yeah, this is kind of a nice thing to be able to do. So I call you and I say, hey, Sydney, interest rates have gone up. Your bonds have gone down. You say, what did you do? Dean, you're so rude. I say, brand new bonds pay more than your bonds. You say, Dean, again, I don't know why you're being so rude. I say, could you use a loss on your tax return? Let's sell your Microsoft debentures and buy you Johnson & Johnson debentures. They're both AAA credit. And take the loss on the Microsoft debentures and, uh, you know, reestablish this uh, position at a higher yield to you. You say, Dean, that's not a wash sale. I say, no, it's not a wash sale as long as I change or alter the bond in some material way. Are we clear? I altered it. Now, instead of being a lender to Microsoft, you're a lender to Johnson & Johnson. However, they both are AAA credit, so they're very similar. This is called uh, bond swap. Perfectly legit. Perfectly legit. And you got it right. And now you know. So some questions like this are, you get them right, and now you know, or you get them wrong, and now you know. So, A technical chart pattern indicates that a stock steadily increased over time, reached a peak, and then steadily declined or decreased over time. This is referred to as... Isn't this a head and shoulder? Yeah, and this is a signal of a revert. Oh, it's, well, inverted. I'm not sure how we got that. I would have missed this too. A technical chart pattern that a stock steadily increased over time, reached a peak, and steadily decreased is referred to as. Yeah, I'm not sure how we would have got that one. Inverted now, I don't think you're going to see a saucer, but you're certainly going to see a head and shoulders on the test. I was just confused. Head and shoulders is a signal of a reversal. And what I would have said, besides the inverted saucer here, is I would have said uh, it is a signal of reversal and it would be the end of the bull, beginning of the bear. But um, that one's on me. Techno, I'm just looking at it. Steadily increased over time. Maybe that's why they're telling us it's not a head and shoulders because it went like this. Increased over time, reached a peak, and then steadily decreased over time. And I would, over time, I think the time period is what turns it into the saucer. But, uh, you know, who cares? Uh, where do sponsored American depository receipts uh, trade? Uh, and uh, A. Boom, New York or NASDAQ. You are correct. Uh, an investor purchases one XYZ corporation call with a strike price of 30. The investor pays $100 for the call. The market price of the stock is 21, 29. At expiration, the maximum amount the investor could lose is? That'd be their premium. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if you struggled on that, right? It's what you paid. Yeah. Right on. So a lot of the, I think what they were trying to do is the Jedi mind trick again. You know, kind of, oh, what's all this information for? Mm -hmm. uh, who has access to the information related to a customer dispute that has been expunged? from the CRD. So you got them to remove that. So when I punch in your name on brokered check, this no longer uh, comes up. If it's been expunged, wouldn't it be like not available anymore? Yeah, your regulators would, uh, yeah, that's the whole point of expunging it, right? Nobody gets to see it, right? 
Uh, I was reading where how many how brokers who get in trouble are willing to pay to get their record expunged, right? They're willing to pay attorneys big time money to get me, you know, off that that broker check. In order to achieve capital growth, the customer may consider which of the following investments. So income is bonds, growth is stocks. So okay, that's exactly right. Preferred and utility stocks. Common stock and index funds. That's a good one too. Capital growth, common stock. Um, I'm between A and C. Is that correct or incorrect? That's correct. Your 50-50 is correct. So now you got to go back and then go what it says, capital growth. I really think it could be C, but I'm on Given that answer, it's a preferred stock isn't giving you capital growth. Yeah, because I was going to say common gives me more growth, preferred that's gives right. me more income because it has that fixed dividend and it that's uh, right. is. That's more. right. And that index fund has the stock set, right? So given that answer set, that was the best uh, recommendation. Uh, with XID trading at 48, you purchased a 45 put at two. What is the time value of that option contract? So for the time value, we don't have to find the break even, do we? That's exactly right. It's really important. So Sydney, well, you know, important in terms of this, you are absolutely correct that all we're asking you about is the relationship Between of the market price. price 48 to the strike price of the option 45. Right. And so the premium of two consists of two things, the intrinsic value plus the time value equals the premium. I think of time value as everything in excess of intrinsic value. Right. So it's trading at 48 and our put is 45. So what is the time value? Isn't it three? Or actually it could be zero. So what is the intrinsic value of a 45 put with the stock at 48? Would the intrinsic value be zero because there it's- you go, right? Zero. There is no intrinsic value in a 45 put presently. Because it's out of the money. That's right. So we still haven't answered the question. Mm -hmm. So the contract is out of the money, has no intrinsic value. And the premium is two. And the premium consists of the intrinsic value and the time value. So two. So two. Yeah, right. Yep. Right, that, right. The 45 put is two points of time. I say, Sydney, if you buy a 45 put at two with a stock at 48, you're paying two points for the time value, the opportunity to be right between now and expiration. And what you're going to have to do is turn your time value into intrinsic value. Different question. At what point would you be able to turn the time value into intrinsic value and break even at 43? Yeah. Different question, right? Different question. Now, I'm as your tutor, much more pleased that you are good at break even gains and losses on advanced option strategies than you are about time value and intrinsic value as components of the premium. That being said, the intrinsic value is more important than time value because on the test, they say you close it out at intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Which term best describes a client who owns more than 10%? of a publicly traded company? I like this question. About the insider. Right on. Remember, they're subject to the volume limitations of 144, right? Mm -hmm. so if they sell stock under 144, they have to file form four within two days or form uh, form within two days. And then you tell them within 10 days when you become one. Yep. Oh, thank God. Okay. Long quiz, one DEF. All right, so you're long a call and short a call, same exact strike price, but it's July and March. Your dominant option is the later one, so shorting a call. So you're a bear, but it's a uh, isn't that the is the uh, diagonal what we talked about the calendar spread? Well, diagonal would be everything is different. Horizontal, sorry, or the yeah. or the vertical, yeah. That's yeah, the horizontal, okay. By the way, everything you said is correct, though. Everything you said is correct. 
right? About, you know, where, what about looking at that spread and which is the greater premium, all that kind of stuff. You're pretty good at that. Uh, SEC Rule 144 applies to the ability to sell restricted stock and control stock. What type of stock is not subject to the holding period? I like this. Control stock. Well, the stock, well, be careful. Control stock is all the stock that the, the person owns, right? Restricted okay. or not, but yeah, boom, right? So yeah. given the answer set, though, you're correct because that's the one that's available to us. Right. Control stock, I remember uh, there was like a chart and like that doesn't have a holding period, but restricted does. Exactly. Uh, the An AMT bond is a form of... An AMT, is that the private? Well, minimum tax. This is very testable. Yeah. Is that the private activity? Yeah. I remember the other time they asked it the other direction, but this is for test purposes, very testable. It's an industrial development revenue bond mm -hmm. or an industrial development agency bond. Okay. Uh, maintaining a fair and orderly market. This is a, a test question on the New York Stock Exchange is a function of, so who does this? Um, is it, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the designated market maker. I don't know if it's a broker's broker, it might be the floor trader um, or the market maker. Mm. Maintaining a fair and orderly market. Who does that? Is it the market maker, the designated market maker? Yeah, formerly known as the specialist. Okay. I like right. had broker's to broker is somebody in the municipal market who helps a municipal bond firm that has inventory. And they or trader have... executes orders for clients of member firms. Mm -hmm. And a market maker remember is over the counter providing liquidity. So they are charged with maintaining a fair and orderly market. They're the ones who are holding the order book, the limit orders. Right? The New York Stock Exchange can best be characterized as an auction order-driven market. Right. So, yeah, that's a designated market maker. I like that. Hoping, hoping we finish off strong here. <laughs> uh, well, you're, I think well, we haven't done the score yet, but we'll see. Uh, what is, I'm pretty sure you're right in, in very safe uh, area based on the mark. We'll see. Uh, break even on a November 50 straddle with a total premium of nine. That is two uh, break evens. Come on. For you, this is a layup. Two break evens. Uh, right on. I'm the only one that even has that. Hey, STC, sleep at the switch, man. <laughs> this is easy because we just uh, can go. We got two, right? Okay, now well, let's make this a little more complicated okay uh what is your maximum loss in this straddle so let's see what kind of straddle it is they uh purchase so it's a long straddle so our maximum gains on limited and the maximum loss is 900 yeah at 50 the contracts expire you lose your money excellent uh okay. so we've identified it we've calculated the break evens uh, mm -hmm. where is it profitable? Do you want the stock to be uh, outside or inside those two numbers? Outside. I love inside. It. You're outside going. I love it. And then when do you do this? So what is your expectation on ABC here? Uh, you're expecting volatility. Yeah, but direction's uncertain. Excellent. 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 An investor buys a municipal bond with a 20-year maturity for $1,200. If sold five years later for $1,100, what is the investor's uh, capital gain or loss. Are you going to be ahead of me? Do you know what to do here? Let's see if you're going to beat me again on the math. Okay, so it's a 20-year maturity for 200 over, and then it's so sold. Yeah, remember, we buy a muni bond at a premium. We have to do straight line amortization down where we have to adjust our cost base each year. We're not allowed to take that $200 loss in one well swoop whenever it's convenient for us. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to adjust it 200 divide by it's 50 20 years and so i have to adjust or decrete i call it decrete people get mad at me but mm -hmm. it's not a test term but decrete is the opposite of acrete we're going downward yeah so we're gonna have to decrete ten dollars a year we've had it for five years mm -hmm. so we should have adjusted our cost base fifty dollars yeah which then turns into a thousand hundred and fifty right on so 
It's a loss. Yeah. What kind of loss? $50 one. Excellent. That's uh, on debrief. People tell me they see that question 50% probability. So, you know, about half the time people tell me they had to do this mm -hmm. and half the time they tell me they did. Uh, the major disadvantage to a limited partner oh, ho, 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 is lack of liquidity. I feel like it's lack of control. Oh, Wait, hold on. Oh, so, let me talk myself through this. Oh, man. I, you know. Let me talk myself through this. Flow through of income and expense. In a DPP, that's like an advantage. Limited liability. Yeah, it's C and D are, are good things. That's a good thing. Lack of control, lack of liquidity. Don't miss that. Oh my goodness. Um, or lack of. That is very much a test question. You can't get in or out of a partnership without permission of the general partner. That is very much a test question. All right. Boom. Uh, let's see what was our overall. We uh, missed. Where's our percent? 83. That'll get it done. Now, I think a couple of these we got right, and it was, uh, I've never used this thing before, so I'm not quite sure. Does it tell us? I'm just uh, go go yeah. up, I think. Let's see. So we go all missed. There we go. Yeah, there we go. And I think a couple of these were, I had my other screen open with with the my dashboard on SDC, and I think that's why it was wobbly. Uh, let's see. If we draw from variable annuity uh, during the accumulation, how is it taxed? Uh, we said LIFO was very important. Uh, number two, so is it feeding us the, yeah, two. We said clients who want to reduce their tax liability may invest in which of the following. We talked about why that was uh, traditional IRAs and partnerships because of the adjusted gross income, right? Mm -hmm. uh, here as a result of falling interest rates, I think this is one of the ones we marked right, but uh, it was jiggly on us. Anyways, we said it's not taxed. You got that right, and I think it was because my screen was open up. So yeah. add one back, add one back. Yeah. Uh, interest received from one of the following, uh, we, that's another one we got right, but yeah. uh, my screen was we open, so saying. give us that one back. So we make a hash mark. So maybe we got, maybe got it. <laughs> yeah. Amor uh, the amortization, this one you did miss. I did. Uh, yeah. So we, we went over that one. Yeah. Um, mediation is chosen as a means to settle. Yeah. I was torn between this one partially. Yeah. I didn't really remember that was on me. Yeah. For not that wasn't remember. a bad miss so far. We don't have any really bad misses here. Yeah. Uh, this year, the, uh, well, that was another one. We kind of went like, okay. Well, I have never seen a question like no, that. I haven't either. What we missed no. on this one, they, they got us going down the wrong road. What we weren't paying attention to was the 30 plus the 12 was 42, but, you know, easy to miss that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a bad miss. We won't miss again. Flexible premiums. Well, now I, I should have read it better. I yeah. think that's all right. Still, we're still 83 is 83. And we got two coming back to you. So uh, an investor purchased 100 shares. Now, you know, not a bad mess. I haven't had anybody tell me. They've been tested on capitalizing your your commission cost into your cost basis ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, confirmations. Uh, confirmations, we won't miss that again. We understood, yeah, written or electronic, save the trees. Uh, which of the following statements is true if a company has raised capital and it's being issued entirely online? Uh, now we know that you need to be a, have a broker. Uh, yeah. I haven't had anybody to tell me they've seen that on debrief. This one where I, you know, this one I even struggle with. I'm not quite sure uh, why this is uh, the, the even here and what the right answer is. So uh, we missed it. Uh, who cares? Uh, we're going to count it as a miss, but we won't worry about it on the test. Uh, again, we don't care about this as a miss because, again, what we need to know is what you demonstrated mastery of is Jenny May and mm -hmm. the difference between Jenny May and the others, which is the test point. Uh, this was a... Uh, uh, did we get that? I think we got that right. Did we not? Did we miss this? No, we got that right. Because okay, I, well, I, don't back. I don't know why I told us. I thought we answered C on that one. I thought. I'm convinced we did. Because... Well, sometimes too, you know, yours truly, I'm the one hitting the buttons and sometimes I could hit the wrong button. I think we got that one right. So three hash marks. Three, they were to three review the video. Coming back to you. Three coming back to you. 
And remember, we went over that action asset amount thing there. Yep. A member firm decided to send on a quarterly basis. Uh, we did just dis we discussed that. Now you know it's quarterly unless penny stocks. Yep. Uh, I've never heard of anybody being tested on the website. Now you and I both know. I didn't know that either. <laughs> How we do? <laughs> it's about the broker dealer's website and not the uh, the Finra website. Uh, received a gift. Uh, they got us on this one. I think both of us squeezed the trigger a little too quick. Uh, I'm the one who squeezed the trigger on A because more often than not, that would be correct. When I read the rationale, I, okay, it got me. You know, you know I'm obviously not going to have a higher cost base if the market value is lower. Uh, you know, again, and 99 out of 100 times on the test, A would have been the appropriate answer. Right. Uh, uh, I missed this one. I'm the one who squeezed the trigger here. Because I thought it, uh, I got focused immediately on the four times they're above their minimum maintenance rather than giving thought to the dynamic scoring uh, available to a. I would have gotten this wrong too, though. Like I genuinely read right, this. So that's, uh, we don't get that one back. <laughs> uh, this one, I don't know. I'll, I'll reach out to our friends at STC uh, on this one. Oats is no longer with us. And that's why I thought A was the better answer. Uh, if Oats was available, uh, then I would think that would be the better answer. But um, it's for limit order protection. So I don't think you'll see that. Um, yeah, that was, a, we we missed that one. You missed that one. The call is what the call away. These other things, the issuer isn't going to repurchase preferred stock at a predetermined price unless it's callable. Right. Warrants are pre so that was a, a legitimate miss. A harder question, but a legitimate miss. Uh, who cares? Now you know. Yep. Now this is why I don't get paid till I give you back your money. Yeah, I didn't know this one either. This was uh, a mess on me. Yeah, who cares? This one. This one, yeah, we I think well, both of us agree this one was kind of funky. Because I just know that for a 529, like if it's a qualified expense, you can withdraw it. Yeah, and right. I assume that like for medical expenses, that's qualified. Yeah, so. so now they're telling us it's it's allowable but not qualified. So again, I, I when I say who cares, I mean for test purposes. Okay. Uh, and again, yeah. inverted saucer. This one, I'm not quite sure how we're supposed to get this, the charting pattern without the chart itself. And my guess is that they would say that it's because of the steadily increased. It doesn't turn into a shoulders. It becomes a saucer. Who cares? Right. And All there right. we go. So uh, kudos to STC. Thank you so much, Todd and STC, for allowing Sydney and I to uh, take a, uh, a shared screen final with uh, the first practice exam from the supplement, $87 for practice exams. Uh, I really believe about seven, 10 days out, you should be taking an intellectual inventory, getting a mark by doing practice exams. And I'm also a big believer in adding different voices to your study. Ever not so many voices you get confused, but you know, if you got a Kaplan Q bank and now you got some STC practice tests, uh, you know, it's good to see how different people ask uh, different types of questions. Same, you have past perfect. Notman uses the Kaplan Q Bank. So, uh, if you're looking for some additional performance op opportunities, as like all practice questions, uh, I would highly recommend uh, the supplemental exams uh, provided by STC. Uh, Sydney, you've been uh, doing lots of practice exams. What were your thoughts about this uh, journey we've just completed? Um, I thought it was a good test. Uh, definitely very, I think it was really good in terms of testing like your knowledge. Um, so I thought it was a great exam. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Better. By the way, we all owe Sydney thanks because she is the one who said, Dean, why don't you reach out to STC and Don? I said, ah, you know, a long time ago I did. And, you know, she kind of said some version of if you don't, if you don't ask, you don't get, uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> and, uh, and hey, thank you so much, STC. So, all right. Yeah. So remember, uh, inch by inch, your exam is a cinch. Yard by yard, your exam is hard. And we will see you for the next explication request.